there are quite a few Germans in the audience, and uh, this lateness is making you very uncomfortable. But this is the Middle East, so we're going to operate according to standard uh, Middle Eastern time. And we're still waiting for uh, uh, one more panelist, uh, Giulio Terzi, who I'm sure will, uh, I hope, will join us, uh, will join us soon. We'll, we'll be able to start. So. So, buongiorno, uh, welcome buongiorno. everybody, good morning. Uh, my name is Amichai Magen, I'm the uh, head of the Diplomacy and Conflict uh, Studies program here at the Lotus School of Government uh, at the IDC, and I'm also a senior researcher at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, specializing um, in issues of governance and, and political violence. So welcome, everybody, to the third day of the conference. Welcome to my favorite part of the conference, which is the, the set of specialized workshops that we have. I always love this format because it's more intimate, it's more interactive, we'll make it interactive, and we can really delve into, uh, into some complex and interesting uh, issues. Let me just uh, make a couple of uh, preliminary remarks before we get into the substance. First, and, uh, first of all, Clearly, uh, this morning, uh, all of us um, have uh, the ninth president of the State of Israel, Shimon uh, Peres, very much on our, on our minds. Uh, Shimon Peres is truly the last living founding father of, of the State of Israel. He's our Alexander Hamilton and our, our Benjamin Franklin, and uh, we all uh, wish uh, him refuah uh, shlema, speedy and a full uh, recovery, um, and... Uh, I know he's um, a great friend of Europe, uh, very passionate about Europe, concerned about Europe. We wish him uh, a speedy, speedy recovery. I have a couple of uh, housekeeping um, uh, announcements uh, to make. First of all, uh, unfortunately, Professor Renaris uh, is uh, also feeling unwell uh, this morning and is unable to join us uh, in, in the panel. Um, secondly, uh, immediately after we complete uh, the workshop, uh, right outside here in the, um, in the lobby, uh, we will hold a uh, memorial uh, service and a uh, plaque revealing uh, ceremony in honor of the late uh, U.S. Uh, Navy Captain uh, Captain uh, Jerome uh, Levy, and uh, after whose name uh, we have a specialized um, uh, scholarship program for American men and women serving uh, in the armed in the armed forces. Hopefully, we can extend that at some point to European uh, men men and women uh, who will also be able to come and do the master's degree here in Israel. But um, right after our workshop, you'll see. Uh, outside um, in, in the lobby, uh, you're very welcome to, to join that. It will be a short ceremony, 15 to, to 20 minutes, and then you're not going to miss lunch. Uh, it's just going to help you build the appetite for lunch, and lunch will be served 
uh, in the sculpture garden um, by the communication building. For those of you who have taken part in the conference in the past, you know where it is. If, if you need some help and guidance to, to find lunch, uh, we have... Um, uh, we have we have our staff here, and and you're you're uh, obviously uh, welcome to uh, to ask and to be and to be guided. Okay, let's so let's talk a little bit about the format of this uh, of the of this morning and how we want to to handle this. First of all, we have we have time, uh, we have time, and that allows us to to delve into uh, some of the issues. We also have uh, truly uh, four uh, outstanding, very experienced, but also uh, uh, panelists with, with very diverse uh, geographical uh, focuses and experience and, um, uh, and, and knowledge about the, 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 issue, the issue at hand. What we're going to do is to begin with short, I want to emphasize this short, uh, formal presentations uh, from each of, our, each of our four panelists, and then we, we open it up. Uh, we open it up. Um, to, to questions and, and conversation, and I want to run this as much as we can uh, interactively uh, because I always find that that's the most interesting uh, part of any, of any, of any discussion. In, in terms of speaking uh, go order, given people's uh, expertise and, and backgrounds, I thought we will proceed as follows. With your, with your permission, we will begin with Ambassador uh, Giulio uh, de Santa, Santa Agata Terzi, I hope Giulio Terzi, I'm okay. to make it easier. Giulio Terzi, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of, uh, of Italy. Uh, we will then proceed to uh, uh, hear from uh, Yassin Musharabash, who is the Deputy Director uh, and Investigative uh, Department of the Zeit in, uh, in, in Germany. Um, we will then hear from uh, Mr. Jan Padurak, uh, the Deputy Director General for Analysis and Foreign Relations of the Office of Foreign Relations and Information of the Czech uh, Republic. You pronounce that uh, Uzi? Uzi? Yeah, Uzi is like the Uzi gun, right, so yes. it's, the, it's the Czech Uzi, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then uh, last but not least, uh, Alexander uh, Ritzman, who is a senior advisor at the European Foundation for Democracy, the EFD, uh, in Brussels, uh, but coming to us from, uh, from Berlin. And I know several of you will be using some visual, some visual aids, and that's, uh, that's, that's great. So let's turn to the, sub, uh, the substance. Um, our overarching goal uh, this morning is to really explore this uh, multi-layered, complex set of relationships uh, between the recent wave of immigration to Europe, so not the immigration of the 1950s, 60s, uh, 70s, uh, but the recent immigration uh, from, uh, primarily from, from the Middle East and North Africa, and the threat, actual and potential, that that wave of uh, migration is posing in terms of radicalization and terrorism on the European continent, uh, and what are some of the existing uh, and uh, potential uh, policy responses for dealing with this new phenomenon? That, that, is, our, that, that is, our, is our scope. Let me just make a couple of intellectual points, if you, if you will forgive me, I, I'm an academic after all, about, about this topic, just to sort of frame it for us uh, academically and intellectually. Um, the first point that I would make in this context is what we might describe as the immigration terrorism nexus is, um, is actually quite a new one. Perhaps that's sort of a surprising thing to say, but the community that's, that's researched and studies empirically, conceptually, uh, terrorism and counterterrorism has traditionally not been very good at dealing with questions of migration and immigration. They've tended to be different communities and vice versa. People who deal with migration and immigration have tended to look at causes of that, uh, uh, into successful or unsuccessful integration into labor markets and, and so on and so forth. The emphasis on, on terrorism, that nexus, uh, is actually quite a, quite a recent one. And Professor Alex Schmidt, who is, I saw that you recently wrote a, a, a paper precisely on that, on that issue. Now, uh, it's interesting. I, I was just reminded yesterday of uh, Hanif Qureshi's uh, wonderful novel, my Son, the Fanatic, that was published in, in London in 1994, talking about sort of first and second generation immigrants to, to, to England, etc. Um, so perhaps, in, as often happens in art and literature, we, we have some examples of, of, of discussion of this issue. But in terms of hard social science, in terms of 
um, really understanding um, the multiple relationships between uh, migration and, and contemporary terrorist threats. Uh, for us as scholars, this is a relatively new field, and perhaps Professor Schmidt could say more, more about, uh, about, about that. Now, that means that even though this topic is sort of all over the news, from a serious, academic, responsible, empirically-based uh, um, point of view, we are confronted, I think, it's fair to say, both by conceptual uh, challenges and by empirical challenges. Um, and, and in a moment, I'll outline some, some questions that I want us to address. And I think that part of our challenge is uh, that we don't have a tremendous amount of well-documented, well-established uh, empirical knowledge. So we, we have a sort of an epistemological challenge uh, at, at, at this point, which we should recognize uh, uh, humbly. Um, and have to sort of fill in the gaps uh, as, as, as best as we can. The, the second uh, point I, wanna, I want to make is that this migration terrorism nexus is actually far broader than what we will be able to deal with this, uh, this morning. Our focus this morning is, is on Europe and the threats to Europe and possible uh, policy responses. But we, if we think about this nexus, and this is, I, I, I'm thinking here particularly about our students uh, potential MA uh, students, people who are thinking about PhDs. I think this is um, a wonderful area uh, for, new, for new research uh, because uh, this nexus um, contains really fascinating contemporary important uh, issues. Let me just mention some of them. State failure, uh, the proliferation of areas of limited statehood of fragile states. We've just heard that this is a key uh, issue particularly for Europe, particularly in the southern Mediterranean, the, the MENA region, but also beyond in the second and third circles of, of, of countries around us. We are increasingly operating in an environment characterized by areas of limited statehood, whether that is complete countries like Iraq or Syria or Libya, or whether it is areas of limited statehood within otherwise functioning states like the Sinai Peninsula or vast cross-border areas like the Sahel region. State failure as a driver of both terrorism and migration um, is, I think, a fascinating topic, uh, which will, I'm, I'm happy for, for anybody who wants to, to touch upon this issue uh, to do so, but, but it's not going to be sort of the focal, the focal point of our, of, of our discussion uh, today. Civil wars as causes of, again, both migration and, and terrorism, another important topic. Refugee camps and diasporas and the relationship between refugee camps and diasporas as both causes but also targets of, of terrorist acts. And the linkages between migration, organized crime, uh, human trafficking networks, radicalization and terrorism, also something that was mentioned this morning, which we perhaps uh, can, uh, can touch upon. So this is, as I said, it's a large, multi-layered, complex uh, uh, set of issues. We won't be able to address uh, everything uh, but we should be conscious of that, of that exciting new sort of intellectual, intellectual agenda. Now, in preparation for this workshop, what I did was to, to send to each one of our panelists uh, a set of, of sort of more specific uh, questions that we might want to address. They are free to address them or free to ignore me. I hope uh, um, uh, that uh, you have managed to, to uh, consider at least some of, these, some of these questions. But let me also share these uh, questions with you before we turn to our distinguished panelists so that, again, we can sort of generate uh, a, group, a group discussion. Um, I, I pose uh, six questions, and I'll, I'll just briefly, very briefly mention them. The first question is, again, empirically. What do we know and what do we don't know about the relationship between the recent wave of immigration to Europe and incidents of terrorism in Europe? Okay, what is the true scale uh, of, the, of the threat? Uh, can we quantify it? Can we measure it? Can we scale it relative to other security threats, right? Because whenever we deal with a security problem, we cannot only focus on that particular actual or potential security problem. We need to uh, prioritize, and we need to allocate resources according to a scale of, of threat. So where in the scale of threat um, it, it, is this in your, in your, in your mind? Uh, is there a substantial gap potentially between threat perceptions and, and actual realities in, in, in Europe, right? Because again, media clearly amplifies this very much. And even very, very few incidents, as we've seen in, in, in Germany and, and France and elsewhere, 
um, generate a lot of a lot of attention, and that always creates the possibility that we are that there is a big um, uh, perceptions realities gap when it comes to the threat of immigration uh, and its linkages with with terrorism. Uh, on the other hand, again, we don't we're at the stage and at, at the moment when we don't have very soundly established empirical uh, information. So how do we manage that uncertainty? How do we manage that uh, that perception? potentially realities kind of gap, okay? Uh, secondly, is immigration to Europe from sources of likely Islamist radicalization and terrorism expected to increase or decrease in the coming years? Can we project sort of future levels of, of, of threats, right? We've heard this morning that only in the past year, Europe has absorbed uh, just over a million uh, refugees, uh, is this likely to... Uh, immigrants, True, right, immigrants, right, correct, that's, that's right. I mean, we need to clarify that language. Um, is this... Uh, uh, are we at the beginning of a large, uh, potentially sort of historic uh, uh, migration? Or are we likely to see Europe close its borders and, and reduce substantially the number of people flowing in, particularly from North Africa and the Middle East? Thirdly, once people are already physically in Europe, what are the key determinants that shape whether immigra immigrants are or become involved in politically or religiously motivated violence? What are, the, what are the key determinants, what are the key drivers of either successful integration or unsuccessful integration? I'll share just a short anecdote with you. I was in Stockholm uh, recently, and I was having discussions with colleagues, and one of the uh, truly... Uh, uh, interesting and, and to me rather shocking discoveries that I made was that a new immigrant to Sweden, uh, it takes an average of a decade for that immigrant to be integrated into the Swedish uh, labor market. What are the consequences of that uh, in terms of uh, successful integration or unsuccessful integration? And clearly there are great variations among the member states of the European Union in the ability to absorb and successfully integrate uh, uh, immigrants. Fourthly, this difference between first generation and second generation uh, uh, immigration. If we look, and, and Yassin probably, uh, certainly uh, that I know knows much more about this than, than I do, and I know Boaz Ganor has done some work on this, we actually tend to see uh, lower levels of involvement in radical activities and certainly uh, actual terrorist activities among first-generation uh, immigrants. And uh, if our historical experience is anything to go by, it's actually a little bit of a sort of a time delay bomb in the sense that we may, especially under conditions of unsuccessful integration in Europe, we may see second or even third generation of immigrants who have just arrived in Europe now, so we're talking about 20, 30, 40 years ahead, who, uh, for a variety of reasons, may be more likely to be involved in, 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 in radical activities and terrorism. Do we, do we accept that? Do we, do we know enough about this kind of first, second, third uh, uh, generation um, uh, dynamic? Uh, two last points, and then we, 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 we turn to the panelists. Existing preparedness. How well or how badly um, is Europe prepared to deal with this threat? We heard two lectures from officials uh, this morning, um, uh, but are we satisfied that, uh, uh, do, are we satisfied that, that we know what the state of affairs in Europe is today in terms of preparedness? Let me just remind you, for decades, uh, the European ethos was about free movement of people, free movement of goods, no borders, uh, openness, uh, multicultural societies, etc. And so, in a way, the recent wave of, of terrorism uh, goes against the grain uh, of uh, a process, a deep and, and broad process of European integration, which has been going on essentially since the end of the Second uh, World War. We shouldn't be uh, surprised uh, that Europe is facing substantial cultural, institutional uh, uh, intelligence challenges. In, in dealing with some of these issues because, again, I think it's fair to say, and uh, uh, perhaps you'll challenge me on this, that for many, many decades, um, the whole idea of Europe 
um, uh, did not really take into account the possibility that this is going to be such a, such a major challenge. And, and if we are, and I think it's difficult not to be, dissatisfied with the current state of preparedness in, in Europe in this context, what cultural, institutional, policy adaptation does Europe have to experience, either at the level of member states or at the supranational level, which we heard more about uh, uh, today, uh, what legal, economic, security changes need to take place for uh, better management of this immigration terrorism nexus in Europe? How does Europe deal with this problem without overreacting, without uh, uh, pushing people in ra into radicalization and, and violent activity where it really doesn't need to do that? How does Europe avoid mistakes that have been made in, in, in the past? And can Europe do it? <laughs> does it have the will? Does it have the uh, leadership uh, to be able to, to deal with it? So I, I hope that that gives us uh, enough uh, uh, food, food for thought. And uh, with that, let me um, uh, turn the podium to Ambassador Giulio Terzi, who, who's going to, to, to start us off. So I, I wish us all a very successful, uh, fruitful um, uh, discussion. We'll have a series of short presentations, and then we'll hopefully have a rich conversation. Thank you. So, Giulio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amikai. Thank you for the invitation, first of all, and uh, for convening such an important panel, an important group of uh, participants to this, uh, uh, to this discussion. Uh, you mentioned, and, uh, and it was moved, I was moved by your reference to the very difficult moment that the Paris family is facing uh, since uh, yesterday, since uh, uh, last night. And um, I, I cannot but uh, say at least a word on the fact that uh, it is uh, very tough to uh, see a giant in the political uh, and intellectual life of, uh, Western, of the Western world over the last uh, five, de five, six decades. Uh, being uh, in uh, such a difficult situation for his health, and uh, also to imagine that uh, what we are facing uh, will, may not benefit in the next uh, few weeks and months of his wisdom and uh, uh, his uh, great drive for asserting the basic, the basic principles of our societies and our liberal democracies in terms of respect of the rule of law, human rights, and, and peace, the, the true concept that he was. I, 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 had, I cannot count the occasions when I had individual and uh, in-group meeting with uh, Shimon Peres, and, uh, and it was impossible to come out of a session with him without having learned a lot and especially having entered in a, a different mood in seeing, uh, in viewing the reality and viewing the, the problems that we are facing. So it is, uh, uh, it is uh, necessary for me to express a, a warm thought of solidarity uh, to Israel, uh, to his family, to him especially, but also to uh, note the coincidence that we are speaking about a major problem for, for all of us, the problem of global migrations, uh, and, uh, and this gigantic figure of Shimon Peres is, is there somehow to guide our thoughts in a sense which is compatible with the values that, that our countries and our societies have been asserting over the last few years. You were saying that we have ample time this morning, but then you corrected yourself rightly with the uh, IDC uh, rule. Well, there is a Chatham House rule, and I think the IDC, ITC rule is that you have to, to be, whatever you say, you have to say that in, in 10 minutes maximum. So I try to, to remain in, in this parameter. 
Uh, let, me, let me start from a factual remark. According to Frontex, the number of illegal entries into Europe by migrants hit the highest point last year. Uh, and as the number grew, a new picture emerged of the land and sea routes that many migrants are taking. In 2015, more than 1. million. There are other figures, but these are Frontex figures, the official European uh, statistics. More than 1 million people crossed the European Union borders illegally, and that was substan up substantially from 2014, when there were, by Frontex, 280,000 detections of illegal border crossings, and 2013 figures of about 100,000 detections. So you see that in the last three years, there has been a really incredible peak going up from 100,000 to 280,000 detection, and then a global um, estimate of 1.8 million people entering Europe. There is a diversion with the agreement with Turkey. Everybody knows that the, this human traffic has been diverted towards uh, Italy, especially. Uh, an, unprecedented, an unprecedented situation for my country peaks up to 4,000 landings a day on the Italian shores. Uh, and, uh, and there is, of course, the Libyan, the Libyan uh, hub of uh, human trafficking is the, has the major responsibility. Uh, and, uh, and the situation in Libya, from the political point of view, is all but encouraging with the news that Siraj government is not yet effective. There was a military operation against Sirte has moved along satisfactorily, not a final uh, solution uh, against Daesh in Libya. But, but still, uh, the government of national unity is not, uh, is not really in place. So uh, the problem with Libya and the generation of migrants flows, migrants flows from Libya will be there for the near future, uh, at least. Uh, the theme of our panel, as, as you pointed out, and the very interesting questions, and thank you also for the colleagues and the other panelists for circulating their contribution in advance. It is, uh, in, in, in a way, uh, courageous in the sense that I'm talking from an Italian perspective. It is a highly politically charged issue. Uh, and especially, at least in my country, I speak for, I'm speaking from the Italian situation, of course, because until March 2015, when the Italian authorities learned from Tunisian, Tunisian investigators that the terrorists involved in the March 19th attack at Bardo Museum in Tunisia, where we suffered four Italian victims and 18 more were killed from other countries, when the Italian authorities learned from the Tunisians that Abdel Majid Tuil possibly the organizer of this attack, had traveled freely from Libya to Porto Empedocle in Italy just a month before, undetected in a dinghy among other immigrants. And that, until that March last year, any hint at the risk that jihadists may hide among migrants crossing the sea from Libya was labeled in Italy by 90% of the people uh, as an anathema. Even after the Tunisian request of extradition of Abdel Majid Tuil, the Italian Minister of Interior insisted for weeks that there was no evidence of jihadists taking the migrants' route, to the point that many in the opposition and the press called for the resignation of the minister. But no minister ever resigns in Italy but myself. So, <laughs> so, so it is, we, we can uh, be at least, this is a positive note about the stability of, of, of the political situation in my country. And, and in fact, until the Bardo's tragedy, no one in Italy even have dared to say that the risk did exist that terrorists could mix with migrants or that migrants of first or second generation in the Muslim families could radicalize and become terrorists. 
to the risk that if he said that, he was immediately labeled as a terrorist, Islamophobic, and so on. Because the deep-rooted conviction was, was the following. These are desperate people uh, fleeing wars and destruction. Uh, there, was an, there is an impulse in Italy, to uh, humanitarian impulse that we have seen also during the earthquake and other major uh, terrible situation that open, open our arms to uh, people in need. And, and this is something that, which is really in our d DNA and I'm proud to say that. The, this, this, this conviction that there was no risk uh, with immigrants was so, so deeply rooted that the EU Commission sanctioned uh, my country, they sanctioned verbally, there were no fines uh, or penalties imposed, but uh, it said uh, it criticized uh, formally Italy for having let tens of thousands of migrants uh, entering without any identification or verification in Italy and then to go on in other European countries. Because there was this conviction that these were only migrants which had to be supported from, uh, from an, an humanitarian point of view. And, and in doing so, uh, Italy ignored certain warnings which were coming from other sources. From, for example, I, I would remember Bou Saab, uh, the Lebanese Minister of Education, had already warned his British counterpart, uh, Cameron, about the peril of terrorist infiltration, exploiting immigration flows. Uh, uh, and he even said that there may be one hidden terrorist, even, even 50 migra every uh, 50 migrants. I don't know how, how one can venture in making some proportions, but, but still it is clear that uh, the Lebanese, the Lebanese intelligence had, had already detected a, a problem in that sense. And likewise, on February 2015, the Mossad reported to the Italian authorities about the presence on Italian soil of at least 160 Daesh affiliates, poten potentially ready to mount attacks. And, and, and they mentioned the Bardo uh, episode in Tunisia, but there was also killings of two Italian citizens in Dhaka that finally changed the perception, the real perception of, of the people. And, uh, and if, you, if you think that uh, a Pew Research uh, in July uh, of in, in, in 10 major European countries uh, realized for the first time that over 50%, 58% of respondents uh, now are convinced that uh, security risk has increased because of immigration. That tells a lot also about the situation in, in my country. In fact, we have, in three years in Italy, uh, entered uh, around half a million of illegal immigrants, a large share of which from Muslim countries, uh, with increasingly high numbers of unaccompanied children and single young men. Although the total numbers of foreign residents in Italy are around 10% of the total population, the share of the Muslim communities is growing much more rapidly than the others as a fact of last year's open door policy. And, and therefore, an advice is addressed by uh, many uh, in, um, among uh, political leaders, especially in the opposition, uh, is addressed to, to the European leaders to, to change this attitude uh, of political correctness and providing true information to their citizens, to raise awareness on extremism, on radicalization, and the need of a very different approach in the way our societies should respond to, to the Islamic uh, fundamentalism. And, and I'm saying that because uh, you may have read reports about uh, Italian school teachers very shy or reluctant in asserting the national values, the constitutional values, our national identity. And, uh, and the complacency also that has been shown at the highest level uh, in, uh, in my country, whenever we have visit from people like uh, President Rouhani, uh, uh, trying not to offend uh, uh, his uh, uh, 
uh, the sensitivity, uh, just hiding statues, uh, classical statues, and so on. So, but this is uh, it's not it's not a matter uh, of uh, irony. It, it is it is a question of uh, showing a, a, a giving a completely wrong perception about uh, the importance that we attach to to our identity and and to uh, and to the need to have a serious uh, dialogue uh, with other identities. Uh, I can do, may take the opportunity of the debate to just to touch upon uh, some legislative proposal which are, have been tabled in Parliament on, on all these aspects, uh, both in terms of prevention, in terms of improving the general situation and how the Italian system is prepared to uh, fight against radicalization and, and extremism. And, uh, and also uh, to touch upon the point of first generation and second generation. I agree with you, Amikai, on the fact that there is a, a second generation which is becoming much more problematic. Uh, there have been uh, surveys very <coughs> important which are still underway. The pleasure of having in front of me Michele Groppi, who is a, a student, has been a student here at IDC and, and is uh, writing a doctorate, a doctorate thesis for the King's College uh, in London. And, and he has worked for a long time on, on this question of finding exactly what is the trend of radicalization in Muslim communities according to the age, uh, to, to, to their, their connection to, to migration and so on. And the picture uh, I, can, I can anticipate for what I've seen is, is quite bleak. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Terzi. Um, I think, especially given the new EU Turkey deal and the continued chaos in, in Libya, Italy will very much be on the perhaps even increasingly on the sort of the front line. Uh, we've seen the landings in, in Lampedusa, etc. but Italy is uh, uh, it's a very, very important uh, perspective. Um, let us now turn to Yassin, Yassin Musharabash, uh, who's going to focus particularly, I think, on the German, on the German experience, but hopefully will address some of my <laughs> uh, controversial questions uh, as well. I want to provoke you all into... Uh, raising these issues. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll try and do my best. Um, first of all, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. Um, as you can see, I will be talking about German, the case of Germany, the German case, and I will be talking very narrowly on the terrorist threat and how it relates to recent immigration. Um, I will have a few excourses here and there, but really I will be talking about terrorism and what it has to do with immigration, in particular with recent immigration. I can only, um, I can only support what Mr. Terzi has just said about the, this being an issue that is highly politically charged. Um, that's not only true for Italy, that's also true for Germany, probably even more so at the moment. Um, I can tell you that it is becoming increasingly difficult to have uh, academic intellectual debates about this topic. Uh, it's, becoming, uh, it's becoming problematic to exchange even data with some people uh, so charged the the, 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 the so charged uh, is the situation that I sometimes find it very difficult to talk about these issues um, in Germany at the moment so I'm glad to do it here uh, <laughs> um, you've probably woken up yesterday um, as I have to the news that there were three arrests in Germany and um, uh, those were three young Syrian men between the ages of 17 and I think 26 or 27 um, who were arrested in northern Germany on charges of having been dispatched to Germany by the Islamic State. And uh, I've spoken to a few people yesterday, a few sources, a few government officials who have been briefed on the issue and my understanding is that what they have uncovered so far is actually pretty indicative of the fact that these people may be part of the larger Paris-Brussels network of terrorists that the IS has infiltrated into Europe. And I'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, but yeah, whenever news like these pop up in Germany, um, it's you know, analysts like, like me who pour over the little details that we can, you know, that we are able to get. And 
and try to get a first assessment of, you know, because one of the first questions always is, is this a refugee? Is this a refugee? Is this a person that was registered as a refugee or is this a person that has been here in Germany uh, for years already? And um, politically, that makes a huge difference. Um, Germany has taken in the vast majority of refugees from Syria over the past, what, 15 months. Um, and we are all hoping, or most of us are hoping, that um, the perpetrators who actually plan and commit terrorist attacks are not among those that we have extended our help to, um, but rather at least please be you know, among those who pretended to be Syrians, but aren't really, because it's much easier politically for everybody to agree that these people are a problem. If we have, and we have had cases like this, if we have Moroccans and Tunisians uh, and Algerians posing as Syrian refugees and then planning terrorist attacks. It's easier politically for everybody across the political spectrum to agree that this is something we need to look into. Let's try and get rid of these people while we maintain the position that it is a good thing to help Syrian war refugees who hopefully maintain their peaceful role that they have played so far and on the whole they have. Um, so yeah, having said that, um, this is what I will be talking about. Three points really. The Ansbach and Würzburg attacks because those are very important in the context of what we will be talking about today. Um, then I will be talking a bit more broadly about IS operatives posing as refugees in Germany and across Europe, the cases that we know so far and what they tell us. And I will thirdly speak very briefly uh, about Germany's jihadist population in general. Um, and one last remark before I delve into this is um, that I think at some point we also need to look at other dangerous people that we are importing through the refugee crisis apart from ISIS terrorists. There are hundreds, if not thousands, uh, of Shabiha, um, of Assad, pro-Assad uh, forces um, uh, who have made their way into Europe as well. There are Hezbollah cadres and operatives who have made it to Europe disguised as Syrian refugees as well. These people are a problem as well. They put other people under pressure here. They are part of organized crime. <laughs> They are capable of uh, violent acts as well, um, and they are a problem. Um, probably not on the same scale, but they are a problem, and they are a larger problem within the Syrian population in Europe, because this is where they exert their pressures mostly. But that's for another day. So let's start with an overview of those two attacks, because not all of you may be familiar with this. Both happened in July 2016. Um, so just a few weeks ago, within the space of six days. Um, the Würzburg attack was perpetrated by a 17-year-old man, Riyad Khan, um, I've abbreviated his family name, um, who said he was Afghan. He may not have been Afghan. Uh, Afghan. He may have been Pakistani by origin. We haven't determined that yet for sure. He arrived in 2015 as an asylum seeker, and he lived in a host family. Because he was a minor, that is an option that is sometimes given to minor refugees who you know, give the impression that they are very well on their way of integration. And that was the picture that was painted of him. He uh, was an eager student of German. Um, he had been offered the chance uh, of uh, uh, professional training to uh, learn a trade. I forget what it was. I think it was, uh, uh, I think he was a baker. Yeah, that's right. Um, so he was taken in by this host family, a German, relatively normal German family, just a few weeks prior to his attack. Um, and there were no signs of radicalization whatsoever, nothing whatsoever. He was just, you know, he seemed to be a happy 17-year-old Afghan guy. Sad sometimes because his family wasn't around, but basically he was doing all right, or so everybody thought. Until one morning, uh, sorry, one evening, he, you know, gets an axe, or a hatchet rather, enters a local train and attacks five people whom he injures. He then runs away. Uh, a police uh, special forces unit that was by complete coincidence, in the area was alerted. Um, they tracked him down, and when he tried to attack them, they shot him to death. Um, the second case, six days later, happened in Ansbach, not very far away. Both of these cases took place in southern Germany. Uh, also in the evening, perpetrated by a, name, by a guy named Mohammed D, 27, a Syrian, who arrived in 2014 as a war refugee in Germany, via Bulgaria and Vienna, which is important because um, his deportation was pending because according to the Dublin Treaty, he, was, he could not stay in Germany. He was supposed to be sent back. Um, he had a history of mental issues. They may have been severe. Um, there were recorded at least two attempts of suicide. Um, and there was a psychologist who treated him who said that 
um, he had been tortured um, and mistreated and that he had witnessed the death of his own family in Syria and he was very confused and very unstable mentally. We do not know until today if he was just posing that all that, that had happened and that was part of his charade, whether parts of it were true, even though he was a jihadist, which he never told anybody, obviously. So there's something that we still need to clear up. He exploded a bomb in a rucksack close to a music festival in a tiny town in southern Germany, which only killed himself, luckily, but injured 15 other people. And we have reason to believe that this was not his original plan. His original plan very likely was to build more bombs um, and not to kill himself as a suicide bomber, which is what it looked like right now. So if you look at these two attacks, the Ansbach one is the first suicide attack in Germany, if we want to call it that. And the Würzburg attack is the first terrorist attack in Germany committed by ISIS or through ISIS with the help of a refugee or using somebody who was a refugee. Let's look at the IS connection or what we know about it. The, um, and this is a picture of the attacker. Um, the Würzburg attacker uh, was overheard shouting Allahu Akbar while he was attacking the people on the train, which was the first indication that this may be a, an attack that was motivated um, through Islamic um, radicalism. Um, he then, um, uh, what happened next was that, uh, and you're probably by now all aware with uh, the Aamak self-start news agency that's most likely part of the Islamic State, it's, an, it's a, a propaganda outfit that um, works for the Islamic State on behalf of the Islamic State and has for the past few months taken it upon itself to claim or adopt rather attacks that happened outside of Syria and Iraq. Uh, for example, the Nice attack and the Orlando attack were claimed by Ahmaq on behalf of the Islamic State. And the same happened after the Würzburg attack. Ahmaq said that um, the person who um, uh, perpetrated the Axe <coughs> attack in Germany is one of the fighters of the Islamic State. And he perpetrated this attack, this, this attack as an answer or as a reply or in reply to um, calls um, by the IS to attack those countries who are part of the coalition against ISIS. Next thing that happens is a video surfaces that he did of himself. It's about it's a couple of minutes in length. He recorded it in Germany. He speaks Pashto in it, and in the video he. He basically says, I am now going out of this house to perpetrate a terror attack. I will kill people in this country that has taken me in as a refugee because they deserve to die, basically, um, as an act of revenge because these countries, including Germany, have perpetrated acts of violence and killings of civilians in Afghanistan, where I am from, and this is an act of revenge that I'm taking. A couple of weeks later, uh, Der Spiegel reported um, that investigators had found out that the attacker had been in touch with an IS operative uh, on the phone um, prior to his attack. The phone number was a Saudi, Saudi phone number, which doesn't mean that the guy was in Saudi Arabia or that he was a Saudi citizen. It could very well be there was a Saudi SIM card used anywhere in Syria or in Turkey or in Iraq. We don't know that for sure yet. Apparently, um, they were exchanging ideas about the attack, and the handler, let's call him that for the time being, suggested that he uh, rather drive a car into a crowd of people, as had happened in Nice. Um, but he refused because he didn't have a driving license, and he figured that was too complicated, and he insisted on taking an axe and entering a local train. So there was an exchange, and there was uh, some sort of direction by ISIS Al get to that a little bit later, but let's talk about the Ansbach attack and the IS connection there briefly. In the Ansbach attack, the first thing that surfaced was a video that accompanied the claim, or contained the claim, rather. Um, there's a screenshot there. Uh, and in that video, uh, it's pretty much, I mean, if you know one of these videos, you pretty much know them all. Um, they all say the same kind of stuff. So also, act of revenge, the uh, Islamic State needs to be defended, blah, 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 blah. Um, but what was interesting is that he, in the video, says, I renew my pledge to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Now, when I, saw the first, the, when I saw the video first and other people as well, we all had the same question. What does he mean, renew? He could have sworn an oath of allegiance privately, and this is just what he meant. You know, I'm now doing it publicly. I've done it privately before. Um, but a day later, um, or two days later, I think, 
Al Naba, which is um, a newspaper of the Islamic State, that uh, a weekly newspaper of the Islamic State, published this article about this guy. And they apparently had prior knowledge of him, or so they claimed. They dedicated a full page profile to him, uh, telling the, his story. And they are saying that um, he was a member of the precursor organizations of the Islamic State already years ago, um, and that he had le he had been fighting with the Mujahideen in Syria from the beginning of the civil war against the Assad regime, that he was an expert uh, in grenade construction, had been working with explosives, and that he had been injured, and this is why he left Syria in the first place. Um, they then don't say how he ended up in Europe. They just state it as a fact. He then went to Europe in brackets, I believe, for treatment. And when he did not manage to get back on the battlefield, his desire to be part of the group was so great that he then decided to perpetrate attacks in Europe, in brackets, at least. You know, that's the least I can do. If I can't get back to fight, I will do something here. Mm -hmm. We have not been able, and by we in this case, I don't just mean the press, I'm a journalist, I also mean the security services for which I do not work, but you know, I'll use we here in any case anyway. We have not been able to corroborate all of these information. I believe that IS has little reason to lie about this sort of thing. Um, I tend to believe most of what they are claiming here, um, especially since uh, in the same article, Der Spiegel also um, noted, or uh, unveiled rather, uh, that also this attacker had been in touch with a handler of the Islamic State um, and had, has had exchanges about the nature of his attack. So um, what does this mean if we look at these two attacks together? I would say they're very similar while being very different at the same time. Let's look at it. Both attackers entered Germany's refugees. Both formally pledged allegiance to the IS. Both were in touch with IS operatives and both sent their videos prior to their attack to Armagh. Exactly how we do not know yet. However, these are the differences. One guy, Riaz Khan, was radicalized in Germany. There's no indication of radicalization prior to his arrival in Germany. Um, while Mohammed D was clearly radicalized years ago in Syria, Riaz Khan had found his connections to the IS online in all likelihood, whereas Mohammed D knew IS cadres personally and had fought with them. Riaz Khan was self-recruited Mohammed Di renewed his own old connections, so he basically re-enlisted, I would say. He had been an active jihadist before. And neither of them, and this is very important in the context of what we are discussing here, neither of them seems to have been formally dispatched by the IS. So even though they were both refugees and part of the refugee influx, they were not part of the scheme of infiltration that I will be talking about next. Mm. I know this is confusing, but I think analytically it is important that we keep this apart. So if we look at, um, oh. so are there any lessons? Yes, I mean, very briefly, I think we can all agree on that. Among the refugees are undetected previous jihadists as well as individuals vulnerable to radicalization. But what I find most important in this context is both the text point to a new kind of category of IS plots that I would call hotline supported or if you find that funnier 0800 Baghdadi attacks, you know, where there's some sort of connection by phone or by hotline or by online, you know, people ask for directions and they then get it, which is something else than being dispatched, you know, with a prior kind of plan or idea of what you're going to do. Um, so let's now look at those other cases of IS operatives posing as refugees, meaning jihadists who are being sent to, to, to Europe, or Germany in that case, but I'm looking here at Europe as, uh, in, in more general terms, as refugees. And the first two cases that we had definite knowledge of were two of the Paris attackers. Two of the Paris attackers arrived as refugees in Greece, coming from Turkey. And they had real fake passports. So this is what the security services in Germany call them, real fake passports. Meaning, those were original Syrian documents filled in with information that was fake and pictures that were fake by the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very hard to detect these as fake documents mm -hmm. because the document as such is real. The content uh, of the document is, is fake. How do we know this? Interestingly, 
we have the serial number of one of the passports that was found in Paris. And also interestingly, it is part of a batch of numbers that we know because this information has been relayed to Interpol by the Syrian regime months before the attack. This is one of the passports that is within a charge of serial numbers, the serially numbered passports in Raqqa. And we know that the IS, when they took Raqqa, had uh, the opportunity not only to, or they, they not only took over these Blanco passport documents, they also had the machines in place to print as many of them out and make passports as they wanted. These documents were not detected by the Greek authorities. They could have been detected had the Greek authorities checked them against the database that was available at the time with Interpol and that they had theoretical access to. But they did not make use of that access. They probably didn't have enough handheld online checking devices. This is one theory I'm hearing. The other is that they were simply overwhelmed by the influx and they, all they did was they take fingerprints and that's it. We don't do anything more. We don't have the time for that. Those were chaotic weeks, and this is what happened. Um, let's go to Austria, because there were two arrests in Austria, in Salzburg, in January, um, that are connected to the Paris attackers. Why and how are they connected to them? They are linked to the Paris attackers by the boat. They came on the same boat. The German Federal Criminal Police, the BKA, took it upon himself to support the Greeks, uh, asked for all the data that the Greeks had, looked into it and tried to find out who else was on that one bloody boat that arrived that day. Was this probably a boat full of operatives? So they find two other guys. They, and what they also find out is that <coughs> they traveled from Syria to Turkey together with the Paris attackers and from Turkey uh, to Greece with the Paris attackers. They got their passports in Turkey, so they're different passports, real fa uh, just fake passports, no real fake passports, just fake passports. But the link was strong enough. These guys were arrested. We now know, thanks to CNN last week, that there was a third person involved as well that visited these Austrian guys. So these are quite definitely, even though they have not been sentenced yet, quite definitely three more operatives that were sent the same way, on the same boat, uh, most likely with the idea of taking part in the Paris attack even, something that they could not do because the Greek authorities detected their fake passports and um, held them for several weeks. This is how they missed the Paris attacks. They then traveled all through Europe, being supported by the IS directly. They even wired money to them from Raqqa. Let's look at Germany. What we have in Germany, apart from the arrests that happened yesterday morning and that I could not work in here yet, there's one case that's interesting, Abdeslam, you probably heard the name, one of the masterminds of the Paris-Brussels cell. <laughs> he, late 2015, drives into Germany with a rental car and picks up three men who are registered as Syrian refugees, picks them up and leaves, never to be seen again. The three guys are gone. We don't know who they are, we don't know where they are. Well, we, don't, we, we know who one of them is now. One of them, turns out, was a North African who was known by the Belgian authorities as a radical. So there's a strong likelihood that these are three other guys that are being picked up by an IS operative you know, coming to uh, Europe or having come to Europe as refugees on the Balkan route are very likely also a cell of people dispatched by the IS to Europe posing as refugees. Um, there are other cases, I will not go into detail, but I, one thing I want to mention is that there are also lots of false alerts. Earlier last year, in January last year, the German authorities arrested four Algerians who had come as refugees and they made it sound like this was definitely a sleeper cell, a very, very big thing. Nothing has come of it. They haven't been charged yet. I don't think they will. Uh, very re or rather recently, a few months ago, there was a similar alert. Um, a number of Syrian guys, one of them had spilled the beans in Paris, or so it looked. He had went, gone to the police and had said, I'm part of a cell that Adnani had dispatched. We were supposed to do an attack in Dusseldorf in Germany. And those are the three other guys. They were arrested. Uh, it doesn't look like this is real. It's probably some sort of, you know, intergroup problem. He wanted to get rid of the other three guys by you know, making them look like ice operatives. Maybe. <laughs> they will most likely not be charged. So, what are the lessons? One thing's very clear, in 2014, at the height of the influx, there were no effective control and registration in EU or Schengen countries. Um, and some EU and Schengen states are or were less diligent and less cooperative than others. Uh, we do not know if IS used refugee streams strategically. I think we now can say there's a strong likelihood they did. But what we do not know is how big is this network. When I spoke to one of the um, 
people I spoke to yesterday in Germany, they hinted that there might very well be more arrests. I think we are starting to see this network unravel, or at least parts of it. If you want my guess, I would say IS did clearly not dispatch hundreds or thousands. I think we are talking about dozens. We have now arrested around a dozen. Let's say there's a dozen more or two dozen more. This is dangerous enough. But this, I believe, are the numbers that we are talking about. So let me quickly say something about um, the German jihadist population. Because, and I, th I, you know, I, I, I would like you to think about you know, the following in this way, just for one second, because there are 5,000 foreign fighters from the West, from European countries, in Syria and Iraq, 850 from Germany, probably 200, 300 of them with the Islamic State, many of them dead already, among other, thing, among other reasons, because they committed suicide attacks in Iraq. There was one German guy who killed several dozen people on a busy street crossing in Baghdad. So while we are talking about the import of terrorists through the migrant situation, I believe we should also think about it this way. We are exporting terrorism also. We are not just importers of terrorism. We are exporting terrorists to the Middle East. As of now, German terrorists have killed more people in Iraq than Syrian terrorists or IS terrorists have killed people in Germany. Just, you know something to think about, I guess. Um, but anyway, this is a little, a few things that you should know about the German contingent in Iraq and Syria. Um, there was a study done by the security institutions based on 677 of them, end of 2015. The result is that 61% of them were born in Germany and 64 of them hold German citizenship. Um, roughly 20% of them are converts, which I think is interesting in the context of our debate. So clearly immigration, recent or, or, or not, is not uh, the, the single cause of the problems we are seeing. Um, I will cut this short a little because I think I'm, I'm going over time, but what's also interesting is that from the 60 plus Germans who I tracked in the ISIS entry documents that I had a chance to look at, when they were asked by ISIS, what do you want to do now that you're here? Do you want to be a fighter uh, or do you want to uh, perpetrate uh, an attack? Or do you want to die as a suicide bomber? This is the choices that they are given once they get there less than 5% said that they were willing to perpetrate a terror attack. If this is any measure for the danger that we may see in the guys that will be coming back sooner or later, um, I would not lose too much sleep over it because apparently they're quite happy <coughs> to die over there fighting rather than come back and commit attacks. Of course, still, these people are dangerous. There's one ex-soldier among them who was in the German armed forces, so he knows some stuff, one chemical engineer, who could probably do a lot of damage once he got back here undetected. So this contingent of people that I'm talking about, the German foreign fighters or the European foreign fighters on the larger scale, when they come back to Europe, in my view, they pose a threat that is equally big as the one that con consists of the network of uh, operatives that IS may have dispatched under the disguise of being refugees. Uh, conclusions, um, I think we are facing three different kinds of threats operatives disguised as refugees, recent immigrants who radicalize here or re-enlist, and self-recruiters and so-called lone wolves. So basically the problem is bigger than just the recent influx of refugees. Three difficult challenges. We need a better understanding of IS planning and infrastructure. Compared to Al-Qaeda, we still do not know much about the Islamic State and its structures. We need more effective intelligence and police cooperation inside the EU and the Schengen member states. I'm sure we will talk more about this soon, but I have heard of seriously unsettling experiences that um, security officials within Europe have had with you know, their opposite numbers in neighboring states. Um, and we need a tailor-made approaches for vulnerable groups, uh, from social work to repression. That's a large scale, a, a large spectrum of, of measures that we need to think about. So the problem has more dimension, dimensions than at any previous time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yassine, for this very uh, close dissection uh, of specific attacks and plots. I think you've really shown us the diversity and the complexity, uh, both of the roots, but also the modus operandi and, and the links. I'm intrigued by this export-import uh, uh, link, and of course it raises the question, will the export then later on encourage uh, imports of a, of a new, new kind? We're not talking economics here, we're talking the imp import of people. Uh, and uh, the creation of, of community, particularly as IS is put under great pressure in Syria and Iraq, the possibility of greater number of returnees, 
and, and the linkages and the networks that are going to be created uh, by people who come from Germany, who know Germany, who may want to return to Germany, but who also do not uh, and, and may be uh, either under pressure or greatly incentivized to bring home their knowledge, their ideology from the battlefield uh, in the Middle East. Also, the mental illness trauma dimension here, this kind of overlap uh, between um, jihadist ideology and intent, but also the experience of mental illness and trauma, uh, either of the refugees themselves or people who have fought on, on the battlefield. I think that's also a really interesting dimension. Maybe we can pick up on these issues uh, uh, later on. But now I have the uh, honor and the, and the pleasure of inviting uh, to the podium uh, Mr. Jan Padurek, who's the direct, uh, Deputy Director General for, let's just call it Uzi. Yes. Uh, for the sake of uh, brevity of the of the Czech Republic, um, great friends of, of of Israel, great friends of ours, and uh, we, we have intimate uh, working and academic uh, links with many Czech uh, institutions. It's it's uh, delight uh, delightful to have you here with us uh, this morning. Please. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, allow me to say first of all, uh, it's my privilege to be here. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, our uh, assessment, uh, our ideas, our conclusions con concerning of uh, terrorism or uh, migration. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I can provide with you uh, some uh, concrete uh, case like my predecessor because uh, my country actually isn't a goal of a huge uh, wave of migration to Europe and uh, uh, unfortunately or I have to say, thanks God, my country is not. Uh, uh, my, my country has no, no, no current experience with uh, terrorism on our territory. So maybe this is the reason why my uh, small contribution will be more formal and uh, more, more global. But uh, uh, maybe uh, some uh, conclusions, some, some ideas uh, should be a little bit different from uh, others. Uh, so, uh, the outgoing uh, immigration to Europe, uh, together with the related fear of uh, terrorist attacks, has almost immediately turned it into a hot topic for experts from social, economic and security fields, becoming uh, one of the highest priority for political decision makers and food for the media. Unfortunately, Europe uh, immediately started to lose control over the situation. Often decision makers used the interpretation of the situation provided by the media to meet the citizen, uh, citizens' demands. The media want to sell their products. Uh, they use stories which appeal to their readership and they will serve exactly what the readers want. Otherwise, uh, they will be replaced, much like politicians. As a result, uh, individual countries lose their ability to keep distance from details and are not able to control the situation strategically. Europeans soon understood that hundreds of thousands of refugees arriving with different roots, cultural, social and uh, religious backgrounds will bring changes. When we don't know what to expect, our primary reaction is fear. They the fear is supported uh, on a daily basis by anti-refugee propaganda, which teaches us that every refugee and every Muslim is a terrorist. Every time there is a problem, we expect someone will solve it immediately. However, we have to realize this is not so easy in the situation when the world undergoes intensive changes often marked by destabilization of nations and regions. Because our society has faced many problems, including surviving world wars, I am positive that at the end we will find a solution to the crisis. The, there seems to be no easy solution to such a complex problem. However, I would like to offer our view a view formed in Central European country, which is by and large conservative, has a relatively small but well-integrated Muslim community and has an average European living standard. At the same time, it is a view coming from country with no experience of conquering another nation, but which has suffered different types of abuse since the emergence of modern society. 
Let me first focus on the vital link between migration and terrorist threats. I believe a potential threat is extremely hard to measure empirically. There is no universal definition of terrorism and similarly there is no mechanism for categorizing refugees as their real threat. We seem to be unable to define criteria as our understanding of the term refugee ranges from a person who came to Europe in the last wave to all immigrants. We evaluate our security systems in terms of their success-failure ratio. Each and every country's security system is complex, with many levels focusing uh, not only on tactical threats, but also on preventive measures, immediate response and <coughs> mitigation of consequences. However, it is difficult to measure success in this field. We all know that we cannot prevent all threats and incidents. Terrorist groups uh, have always been able to infiltrate the Western society. They do not need a refugee wave to conduct attacks they, uh, as they uh, are extremely successful in influencing individuals born in Europe by exploiting their hardships and frustrations without having a direct contact with them. In my opinion, there is no direct, between, uh, direct link uh, between a refugee wave and increased terrorist threat. We have to understand that following two aspects, the immediate impact on security and the potential to influence security in the future, which I believe is much more important. The immediate threat to security is more likely linked with frustrated refugees who could easily turn aggressive after long months of waiting in camps, living in horrible conditions. These individuals could even result to killing people around them, but we could hardly describe this as an act of terrorism. However, when an individual kills someone outside of their immediate surroundings, outside of a refugee camp, uh, we tend to label this as terrorism because we want to see it this way. Such uh, unfortunate incidents accompany similar crises and uh, security systems usually respond to them appropriately unless they are blocked by political decisions or other factors. In the beginning of the crisis when the border control collapsed, refugees were registered only based on the information they provided. Measures adopted to maintain security in Europe do not mean Europe is unwilling to help. On the contrary, Europe is willing to help, but in a controlled manner, Europe needs to be responsible. Europe is now very polarized uh, on the issue of refugees and uh, the situation is getting worse, which is, in my view, the main threat for the next 10 or 20 years. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot uh, hope for gradual and easy integration of refugees when there are hundreds of thousands of them. Instead, we have to develop social programs and provide education to prevent future threats. There are still many extremists in European society who would like to exploit the presence of immigrants to reach their goals, which is mostly power, influence and money. They employ the rhetoric of national patriotism or protectionism and other populist gestures when it seems that the state is failing. They, are any excuse, uh, they use any excuse to attack refugees verbally or physically. Terrorists generally aim to spread devastating fear to paralyze the entire society. When asked about refugees, most European will answer they are scared of terrorism and losing their culture as well as their traditional lifestyle. A good example is current influence of so-called Islamic State. With their media propaganda, they are more successful than they would be with actual terrorist attacks. In addition, propaganda will attract lone wolves in, future, in the future. These are the serious challenges for individual countries and their legal systems. 
they have to be able to control the situation and prevent individuals from committing crimes regardless of their origin or status. It has become apparent that tolerating behaviors which are not allowed in the majority society has created animosities leading to an even larger polarization which is not preferable. Currently, one part of the society would like to get rid of the refugees while another support them unconditionally. My worries are that the rational middle ground group is the smallest unlike in previous crises. Terrorists are not responsible for the migration crisis. The recent increase in their numbers is caused by the same conditions which led to the migration crisis. However, however, terrorists profit from the crisis. They want to see Europe unstable, divided and afraid because they believe they can change the world to suit their needs. They see to impact uh, of the immigrant crisis in Europe in news and they know every complication benefits them and they, their goals. Our task is uh, to convince individual nations to combat fear and trust the system and its ability to provide security. The way out will be very difficult because the immediate reaction itself is not easy. However, the worst is yet to come. European nations will have to find a compromise between an open society promoting freedom and free movement versus building offences and their borders and increased security with the restrictions that accompany it. Upon a closer look at the European ability to handle the crisis, we can see different levels of readiness. I would like to go back uh, to the security system levels. I mentioned it uh, in the beginning. These systems are able to discover threats and react to them. The question is, is if uh, they have or will have enough capacity to prevent all potential attacks. Threats are changing and so are we. The mainstream media and political criticism uh, of security systems and their cooperation in Europe does not re reflect uh, the reality. Often the individual country's legal framework is not ready to handle the new situation, but still the security systems do work and cooperate. Europe faces its traditional internal problems. There is an ongoing discussion on improving coordination, where to focus the decision-making or whether to create another strategic international body which will serve as an umbrella for the existing strategic bodies. The decision we will make today concerning the Islamist terrorism or global jihad in the light of the refugee crisis will define the European counter-terrorist security for the next 20 or 30 years. So, thank you for your attention and uh, I am ready to react for your question a little bit later. Uh, Jan for um, uh, putting a spotlight really on this uh, interaction between public perceptions and uh, the dilemmas that policymakers are facing. Uh, thankfully, the Czech Republic has not faced uh, an attack on your on your soil. Although I know there have been some uh, uh, limited uh, attempts at the online radicalization and some some problems within within mosques. Uh, but obviously, uh, Czech Republic and, and Prague in particular um, are an attractive target uh, for, for attacks, partly because of the openness, the proximity uh, to, um, uh, to, to Germany uh, and, and, uh, and uh, also the Czech foreign policy, its friendship with the United States, its involvement in, uh, in, in Iraq, its friendship with Israel, etc. Et so obviously we, we wish you that you're, <laughs> you will continue to be safe and uh, and unprotected. And we thank you for your for your observations. Um, last but not least, in this in this part of the um, panel, before we, we open this up uh, for discussion, uh, we're honoured uh, to have um, uh, Alexander uh, Ritzman, the senior advisor uh, 
of the European Foundation uh, for Democracy. Uh, Alexander, I know you also wanted to to use some visual aids as well, right? Um, you actually need a, you need the board. So the, I apologize yeah. because I would suggest because I need to move around. No. My ah, okay. Uh, so you also can see it. Okay, good. Yeah, we will. And uh, I should have brought my jacket, obviously. I think it is a, I'm happy that I move around. I think it's very cold in here. I don't know, I see a lot of people shivering. Maybe we can increase the temperature one or two degrees, if that's possible. Save some energy, do something good for the environment. Yeah, that will be perfect. Thank you. So, European Foundation for Democracy, just so you know what we do. Uh, we're not a think tank, we're a policy institute. This means um, that we do concrete projects and related research. We empower Muslims, liberal Muslims, uh, individually and as networks in Europe. Um, we uh, educate and uh, inform policymakers in Europe on uh, extremist ideologies, the challenges to understand it, bureaucrats, policymakers, media people, and we work with Syrian refugees. Uh, we have 500,000 refugees from Syria in Germany alone. We do capacity building, we try to empower them to organize themselves, to uh, talk with the government, because nobody talks to them. We talk about them, but they don't have a structure um, to talk to the government, to the media. So we're kind of a practical institution with a research background. So after these presentations, these very informative presentations, I, do I have to do something maybe, or should I, should we push or pull or something? There's someone with a handy hand. We're not called the startup nation for nothing. Yeah, yeah, we need to. No? It was actually really good to have the board because I tried to do a PowerPoint and I looked at it and I said I can't do that. It's just, ah. Very good, excellent, ah, Elat, excellent. European Foundation for Democracy. We're based in Brussels, uh, but we do work uh, all over Europe. So it would also be good not to have this uh, displayed. More technical advice, anyone? So Yassin uh, ended by saying that it is a complex pro problem that he was uh, describing, and we arranged in the beginning that I would not repeat what he just said, and he, I think he did a fabulous job. Um, I will show more complexity of the problem, more problems, and I will try to also indicate how we might be able to address it. Um, I started working on the issue when uh, the focus was on right-wing extremism and left-wing extremism. And uh, like radical mosques were some sort of concern and the Muslim Brotherhood was somewhat in the media, but so before 2001, right? So I, I have a broader perspective on the issue and I would like to share this with you. And that's why I need a big picture, right? That's what we all want. So I'll start with, I practiced all night. <laughs> so this is the German Society, if you can't read it, I'm sorry. This all is the society, right? It's actually like this. And then we have the uh, right extreme, and we have the left extreme. I just put here political Islam. Three actors within society. We have the state, which means security agencies, everyone who is involved in managing, dealing, responding, preventing, <coughs> all this, right? So these are four actors within the society. Now what we usually have is a conflict here between these two. This is an old conflict. The right fights the left. They mostly attack each other. If they don't fight each other, they fight with the state, police, right? So most incidents in the last decades took place either state to extreme or within the extremes. The political Islam was not really involved. Of course, there was some interaction, but not violence. We talk about violent extremism. 
So what has happened recently is that the group of refugees became more prominent. I put them here. I just make it an R. Um, these are not necessarily proportional, right, just for uh, you to see them. So there's a larger group, the refugees, in this situation. Now, what is new, and I'm not sure if it's a trend. I think it is, but I cannot document it. This year is, of course, growing. We have 40% increase in violence committed in a right-wing context in the last three years. And the astonishing number for everyone who works in this field is that 80% of the perpetrators have no criminal background, are not involved with uh, right-wing extremism, are not on the screen of any intelligence or police force. So we have a massive uh, increase here in terms of quality and quantity. So it's not just Nazis getting more aggressive or NPD, right-wing party members taking action. It's neighbors and concerned citizens, people who might have spoken out at the Stammtisch in a, in a local village, uh, now do something about it. Now the left in Germany has been in crisis for a long time. They were disorganized, they didn't have the support they wanted, but now since the right is growing, they are getting some more attention, some more structure, they're getting listened to more, they do more counter demonstrations. They mostly counter the right, okay? Now this is something that has been going on for a while and is increasing due to an increasing number here too. So this is increasing, then this feeds off this, they get stabilized and get a little better, right? The new dimension that I would like to highlight, one of them, and I make this thinner here, this one is thicker, this one, right, because there's more violence. We have now right-wing extremists fighting Salafists. They're called, for example, ho ge -za, hooligans against Salafists. So they are rockers, hooligans, violence-affiliated people who now say we fight extremism. The other, the bad guys, right? And this is rather new phenomenon, and there were clashes and organization and, and uh, demonstrations. It's not a mass phenomenon, but it's repeating itself, and it's quite interesting because it's new and it's adding to the dimensions that are growing. And another interesting fact is we have not necessarily violence yet, but we have from the left extreme, and I really like this, they have a new slogan. There were demonstrations in Bremen, um, a famous German Salafi um, convert, preacher, um, Pierre Vogel, a former boxer. Uh, he speaks like the normal dude does. He has no skills whatsoever. He just talks, and people like him, and he's very friendly, and he, he studied Arabic, and he knows a little bit, and he's very practical. He tells you how to brush your teeth during Ramadan so you don't swallow a drop of water. <laughs> he's very practical. And he has a lot of followers who like that. So he's not giving big lectures. He's also uh, confrontative, confrontation with the, with the Islamic State. He's challenging them. So he's not advocating violence openly, but he is, a, he is an extremist. So he was in Bremen. And the left extreme organized a demonstration against him with the slogan, no religion, no state, no caliphate. So suddenly, we have the left jumping on this whole thing. They were not involved with political Islam whatsoever before. They were rather sympathizing with it because, you know, against Israel, against the US, against democracy, against capitalism, against the European Union, this is what usually unites these three, right? So the right is against all what I just mentioned, the left is against that, and political Islam is against it. That's what they share. Of course, everything else they disagree, except that they all want their perfect utopia. The, folk, the perfect, you know, white uh, Aryan super state, the super caliphate, and the workers perfect uh, nation. So what is, so we have, 
not really violence, but signs of violence here. We have some violence here. We have massive violence here over decades and some violence here. So to me, when I, when I tried to make sense out of this, it started to look like a circle, right? And it feeds of itself, so it's growing. So this number is not going down. We have 500,000 Syrians. The federal government is calculating with a million Syrians in the next three years because the first batch of them are allowed to bring their families. The law has changed after that. So there will be a million Syrians plus the Afghans, plus others, Eritreans, and uh, other people. So this will grow. And if this is connected to this, and this is connected to this, and these two have an issue with this, and of course, this one here is not attacking the refugees. They want to have them. We have Salafis hanging out outside of refugee housing homes. We have the Muslim Brotherhood volunteering with their expertise in integration. We have the German government completely overwhelmed, saying, well, we work with everyone who is willing to help. So they work with Muslim Brotherhood groups. And then they're very astonished that the organization they fund is actually mentioned in the National Intelligence Report as an extremist organization it happened. So this is currently um, happening. And as you can see, it's not good. Now, this group here has re not really been growing, but it's also growing. Why? I could say Burkini, right? Uh, Burka or headscarf. The, the ones that are not necessarily involved in right-wing extremism, not in left, that are just citizens are scared of terrorism. They hear that you can see what's in somebody's head if you see what's on their head, right? Uh -huh. So they say, wow, so there's people here and people here. So this group is growing, which then leads to more support for here, which leads to strengthening here which at the end leads to a strengthening here. OK? So this is the more dimensions, more problems that I wanted to show you. Looking in the future um, and making the problems we already deal with uh, look almost manageable, if this is true. So what I showed you is based on reports and facts. I cannot bring evidence that it will grow. Um, as I said, there are not so many hooligans and right-wing Nazis now organizing against Salafists. There was only one big organization that called out the caliphate. So they said no religion, because they don't want religion, no state, because they're anarchists, and no caliphate. And the no caliphate is the new thing. So this has a dynamic that we will have to address. And this is Germany, right, uh, in the middle of Europe, um, kind of designed to help saving the European Union, and foster integration and all. So what we do as the European Foundation for Democracy, uh, we decided to uh, invest a lot of our time and effort into prevention. Prevention has many aspects. Prevention of radicalization that leads to violent extremism. Um, we do different things. One is we address propaganda. So part of the success of the Islamic State has been highlighted. They're very good at communicating. They're very good at uh, telling narratives, at giving people a reason to do something. So we deconstruct these uh, narratives. We are involved in counter-narratives with the Radicalization Awareness Network of the European Union. Uh, it's a big project trying, uh, or has been bringing together practitioners mostly. So all these NGOs, social workers, um, everybody who has to do with radicalization, the Radicalization Awareness Network of the EU brings them together, workshop, best practices, all that. And now we've uh, involved a, a research part there as well. I, I um, chair the radicalization, the group on counter-narratives at the RAN, the Radicalization Awareness Network. So this is one thing we do, deconstructing. And then right now with the industry, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and others, it's about empowering NGOs coming up with credible counter-narratives, challenging what the Islamic State and others are doing, right-wing, left-wing. But the focus at the moment is, of course, uh, Islamist terrorism. Uh, there's a technical dimension to it, algorithms, right? So 
the challenge with the Islamic State, for example, is that they don't have two or three outlets that you can shut down. They have a swarm that broadcasts. It's a so-called swarm cast. So you have four, five, six professional broadcasters, and then you have these hobby jihadists who jump on it and twist the message a little bit, add their own video, distribute it within their network. So if you don't stop the videos from the very beginning, if you're half an hour late, it's 500, 5,000, 50,000 messages. So we can only counter a swarm in a way by creating one, which is kind of challenging for governments and NGOs, but this is one of, one of the things. And the other is shutting them down as early as possible. And there are algorithms in the making already developed um, that look at this. How can algorithms uh, code, identify extremist content? Um, how can it be shut down before it reaches this uh, swarm dimension? And we're also a little bit involved in that. But counter narratives are only one part because the people who actually go to Syria and Iraq go usually because someone's talking to them individually at some point. 80% have a personal connection. Research indicates at least friends, family, someone who at some point they trust. So they, they believe the narrative because the messenger is someone they trust and they know. The rest, the so-called online radicalization, most of the time, at some point, if you're hanging out on, for example, ISIS websites or affiliated websites, you like them, you comment, you get an email and they, hey, they say, hey, what, what are you doing? How are you? Are you Muslim? Do you have problems? Do you want to talk? And they do this for weeks, for months. It's getting shorter, actually. People are, were, were, willing faster to move. This is also now slowing down since the caliphate seems to collapse. But there is a personal connection to it that we underestimate. So it's basically a social worker online. So while we develop credible counter narratives, we also have to back this up with kids who search for ISIS content or individuals. They should not only lead to a smart video that explains that ISIS is lying, it, they also should have a personal contact by a trained professional that talks to them, because that seems to be essential. So we're also working on this a little bit. And then there's offline. Offline is still very important in prevention, empowering communities. And we work with Syrians a lot. So we try to do capacity building, as I mentioned at the beginning. Preventing um, radicalization, a part of it is empowering communities and individuals to speak up for what they want, for what they need, so they can participate in the process. And we have a program, it's called Young Leaders for Syria, uh, where we do workshops uh, with uh, people from all kinds of backgrounds from Syria, except for Islamists and Assad uh, people. Everybody else we bring together, and we identify people we think need more training and could have an important role in Germany in the integration or when they go back, because right now they all want to go back. It's a misunderstanding that they're all happy and that they're planning on how, in a house in, in Schwarzwald, in the Black Forest in Germany. They want to go back as soon as possible. So we have to differentiate between short-term integration, waiting until the conflict is over, until security is established so many can go back. And some, of course, will stay forever um, and as long as the conflict endures, the, more, the bigger the number will be that stays. So once they have children in Germany or in France or in Britain or in Italy, and these children go to school, they will more likely stay in Europe. And it can be an enrichment and it can be a great success, but most want to go home right now. And we have to deal with them differently. If we say you have to speak perfect German before you can really do a job here, and that takes five years, and they're not even planning on staying five years, we might do this, the wrong thing. So prevention, policy actions, as I highlighted, we have, to, we have to deal with propaganda, online, offline, technical solutions, algorithms, social workers. I want to highlight that because that's not a priority yet. Everybody is happy that Google, Facebook, and Twitter are proactive. But you, the propaganda itself is just a tool. At the end, it's about a personal connection and empowerment of those who are credible uh, voices in their communities uh, is something that uh, should be done. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Um, I think what you've you've done with this uh, Kandinsky-like um, <laughs> sketch is first of all remind us um, how complex and how many mo moving pieces there are here, um, and how this whole discussion is in, is actually embedded in a social, cultural, institutional, economic context, which of course is, is even far more complicated from what you have drawn because Germany is embedded in, in Europe and, and um, uh, there is the temporal dimension, there is the, the, the uh, communication dimension. So this very quickly becomes very, very complicated. But I think this is actually a, a wonderful launching pad for our, for, for our discussion. And just, just to get things going, I think, um, um, what what um, what Alex has drawn here um, demonstrates the importance of societal let's call this the incentive structure right I mean one of the key pillars of counterterrorism is that you want to keep this group as small as possible you want to um, number one reduce the number of people I mean you also want to keep this as small as possible, presumably, and that as small as possible. But let's just focus on, on, on this for the, for the time being. You want to create an incentive structure, i.e. both positive incentives, economic integration, social integration, education, um, all, all, of these, all of these things which require not only a whole government approach but a whole society approach, as you've kind of alluded. Um, but you also want to create negative incentives, right? You want to have the legal tools. You want people to know that if they're going to get involved in this, they're going to be detected, they're going to be uh, prosecuted, and that, uh, that the state has the tools to, to, to deal with them. So we need to think about the incentive structure both positively and, and, and negatively. And, and a, a critical pillar of counterterrorism uh, policy is that you want as few people to join this circle of radicalization as possible. And from within the circle of, of already radicalized people, you want to take as many people out as you can, hopefully in you know, peaceful ways. And you want to reduce as much as possible the number of people who make the transition from radicalized uh, but not equipped and active to carry out terrorist attacks, right? So you want to, it's all, it's all about numbers, right? Um, it's also all about numbers, uh, and, and this I want to pose as a question to, to, to all of us, uh, when it comes to um, how many um, immigrant attacks, I'll, I'll put this pretty crudely, um, how many um, immigrant attacks can, let's say, Germany or German society sort of stomach before uh, it becomes very difficult to make the case that this is not, that, that the problem are not, are, not, are not the refugees, right? I mean, this is something that Yassin sort of started to, to allude to. Uh, there's clearly already quite a lot of discomfort about this actual and potential link or sets of linkages between the refugees and terrorist um, activity. But is there a sort of a critical mass, is there a tipping point where if this group becomes too, too large and we have that vicious circle created, which, which Alex has alluded to, then we get ourselves into a sort of, you know, Pandora's box opens and we get into a very negative kind of downward spiral uh, in terms of uh, the public, um, um, I don't want to use the term freaking out, but, but essentially the public... Um, becoming uh, sort of aggressively concerned about this. Uh, this uh, perhaps produces a wave of um, uh, negative violent actions against, against refugees, fueling radicalization, fueling and basically making the, the, the work of the Salafists much easier, and we get into this kind of vicious cycle. How do we prevent a vicious cycle and try to promote uh, the opposite of that? Um, of more successful in, in integration. Um, I, 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 I open this up. Who would like to take uh, Alex, do you want to start and then we pass to, uh, go to Yassin? And, yeah. And, 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 yes. Very simple, yeah. by Alex, listening yes. to Yassin. That's how we address this. Because he highlighted, the, uh, he highlighted that if, a, if, a, if ISIS sends an operative dressed up as a refugee 
and we say a refugee committed an attack, we're actually falling for the strategy of ISIS here, inciting hatred and distrust within European societies, reducing what they call the gray zone. They want to force Muslims to commit either being with them or against them. And they say most Muslims are caught in the middle doing their daily stuff, are not involved in any of this. So we need to increase tension within society so Muslims feel that they have to pick a side. And some will then join the ISIS ideology because ISIS says you don't belong there, they don't like you, they hate you, they, they fight Islam. So this is a, a smart strategy. And if we don't listen to people like Yasin, if we listen to other media folks who have no idea what they talk about, politicians who have no idea what, I'm so frustrated, I've done this for now over 15 years, after every attack, it's like someone deleted the memory of what we've learned before, and they say, really stupid things, you know, like ISIS is just a bunch of barbarians and they don't have any, anything they fight for and oh my God, they're so terrible. We missed it. 80% of ISIS propaganda is positive. Come to us in our warm, cuddly new family. Bring everyone. It's going to be great. You're going to go to paradise and we kill our enemies. But, you know, and we miss all that because the complexity of the threat is not transported and explained properly. And this could be a lack of knowledge or lack of effort, I don't know, but the refugees are not the problem. They are not the problem yet. The federal police in Germany statistics say that the average Syrian refugee commits fewer crimes than the average German citizen. Should I repeat that? No? Good. Fewer crimes. That's different from immigrants maybe from the Balkans or other places, right? But the, if we look at the Syrians again, the biggest number, they commit fewer crimes because that's not why they're here. They're here for security, safety. They are traumatized. They have lost people. They're looking for safety, right? And it's up to us what we do with them. So that's why we need a bigger effort. Thank you. Um, Yassine, you wanted to... I, I would love to say something. Then I yes. think uh, Mr. Terzi yes. also needs to say something. But I'll gladly Good. start because let's dwell on Germany for a second. But I think yes. it's really important. Um, sure. Could I, you just use the? Oh yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Um, f first of all, I think um, it's becoming yet more complex. We have. Ha I mean, how would you call it? Let me put it this way: If somebody throws a hand grenade at um, a house in which people are living, if somebody burns or tries to burn a house in which people are living, how do you call that? For political reasons. I call it terrorism. If that is terrorism, then we have had hundreds of cases of terrorism in the past 12 months in Germany, but they were perpetrated by right-wing people. They attack refugee homes, and that's usually not the big story. So if there has been an increase in terrorism in Germany based on the influx of refugees, I'd say the answer is yes, but it's on the right side of the spectrum. It's not the Islamists who do it. It's the right-wing people who do it. So we already have a really, really tense situation in Germany. And it's a miracle that no one has died yet. And I don't want to know what Germany looks like once that happens. Um, so that is something you also have to bear in mind. And I believe every Western European country is one big attack away from becoming panicky, including Germany. So it's very hard to you know, say in advance what would happen. But I don't think, I, I think the times of a stiff upper, uh, uh, sorry, stiff, what? Stiff upper lip. Yes, like we see in, in, like we saw in Britain in 2005, I think those days are over, unfortunately. I think there's only so much more that Western Central European states, societies, as a matter of fact, are willing to accept. And I'll give you one other example. This is how complex the situation is. It's not necessarily an attack that we need as an event that really changes things. It can be something like what happened on New Year's Eve in Cologne in Germany, because that really changed things in Germany to the worst. And I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with what I'm, with what I'm referring to. On New Year's Eve, for reasons that, and we have tried to investigate this for half a year with my newspaper colleagues, for reasons that are not entirely clear, um, but there, there was no organized plot or anything. But on that night, on New Year's Eve um, last year, Around two to 3,000 migrants, mostly from North African countries, converged in the area around the central train station in Cologne. They, most, they were mostly drunk. They were mostly high on drugs. Um, and they started behaving chaotically. They started firing firecrackers at one another. It was a dangerous situation. There were lots of Germans around there. 
um, who wanted to celebrate, celebrate uh, the uh, passing of the year there. There were many women there, and many women were assaulted, sexually assaulted by these people. Um, we have nearly 1,200 uh, cases of um, violent and criminal acts perpetrated in that night, and we have several hundred women who have pressed charges because they were sexually assaulted by these men. There's no, there's, no, there's no making this look pretty. This is what happened. So what we have done in our papers, we have tried to speak, we've spoken to three dozens of these, of the, of the perpetrators, guys from the perpetrator side who were there. What, what is it? What happened? Why did you do that? You know, all these guys had come from Morocco or Tunisia or Algeria within the past few months. They had all been part of the great influx of migrants into Europe, but they are no war refugees. There were no Syrians. There were no Afghans. There were no war refugees. They were people trying to, you know, they heard. This is what they told us. I was plucking olives in Italy, um, and then I heard the Germans let everybody in, and you can have a great life there. So they packed their bag, and they come. And then they, you know, are in Germany, and they realize it's not all that great after all. Uh, and then they, you know, many of them have an alcohol problem. Many of them have a drug problem. And when they find themselves in a situation where there's a critical number of them, as happened on New Year's Eve, and that some of them start doing stupid things, and the police doesn't act, which also was a problem on New Year's Eve, well, then this sort of thing happens. Now, the result of that particular night in Germany was devastating, and I swear to you, it was more devastating than a terrorist attack could have been. This was the day that the culture of welcome in Germany was ended, and it was ended by recent immigrants who behaved like, sorry, assholes and criminals. Um, so it's not only terrorism that can change things. Um, sometimes it's unexpected things. It's also the fact, I believe, that what, you know, New Year's Eve worked in that way not because of what it was, but because there were already many people waiting for an event like that. You know, they were already feeling that, you know, this is getting on my nerves, you know, this is getting too much. And then this happens, and then they find a reason. It's like a security valve that breaks. Now you can say it, you know, I hate this. I don't want this anymore. These people need to leave. So the political debate in Germany has changed on January 1st, mm -hmm. and I believe for good. I'm, I'm sorry I got so excited no, 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 about no, that, no, but no, I think no, we no, need no. to you know, yeah. bear in mind that okay. there's other things than terrorism and counterterrorism that play a role here. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, somehow to comment and to react in a way um, to uh, a, a sense that I got from Cavolo's intervention um, here that still there is, we cannot say that there is a direct link between immigration and an increase in terrorism, in terrorism activities. I, I don't say terrorist attacks. I, I say terrorist activities or jihadist movement or networks which are developing among the immigrated communities. And if I have heard correctly, uh, I have the impression that there is not a definite conviction among, a conviction among, among the panelists that this direct link is already proven. I, I'm reacting to this because uh, uh, although my country has had the chance up to now, but everybody says that it's purely a chance because we are expecting that sooner or later something bad uh, or worse uh, from what has happened up to now in Italy will happen. But, but that does not mean that jihadist organizations have not developed and found the favorable field in Italy among the immigrated communities since at least 30 years ago. The, even the old immigration, I'm talking about Muslim immigration in my country. 1.6 million Muslims who are present now, probably, this are, is the official estimate, probably with the latest three years arrivals, they are around 2 million. And in, in these communities, unfortunately, a, a marginal minority, but the marginal, marginal minorities within these communities have been able to set up very dangerous networks, global networks, operating abroad, operating in Italy, but uh, 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 being present in all the spectrum of, of jihadist activities. And these were from Muslim immigrated communities. I can, I can mention, and, and there are, there's been recent events, and that is not a, 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 an analyst uh, impression. This is uh, the, uh, the outcome of dozens, perhaps hundreds, of investigation, inquiries, trials, 
and uh, sentences given uh, with uh, hundreds of uh, years prison of jail condemnation which which have been so it is it is a very documented result so I'm a little puzzled. How, how can we say that there is not a direct connection between what is going up in terms of radicalization among these Muslim communities and the spreading of jihadists and, and terrorists? I can, I, I, can, I can mention only three most recent uh, findings of, Itali of Italian judiciary authorities and police. March 2012. In Brescia, uh, they arrested Mohamed Germoun, a 20-year-old Im uh, Moroccan immigrant, grown up in Italy. He was planning an attack against Milan Jewish community. In May 2013, Germoun was sentenced to five years and four months in jail. Related investigation, oper Operation Niria, ended in 2012, brought to light the existence of a network of Italy-based jihadists who translated and shared jihadist texts on an array of blogs, forums, and social network sites. June 2013, authorities arrested Anas El Aboubi, another young man of Moroccan descent, had grown up in Brescia area. The man attempted to start, uh, to, he started an organization called Sharia for Italy, and was accused of planning attacks in Brescia. Uh, June 2013, an Italian convert from Genoa, Ibrahim Giuliano del Nevo, was killed in Syria while fighting with jihadist militia. I, is a long list of uh, judiciary investigation, which, which dates back, if you want to, to go to the, uh, to, the, to the origin in the older Muslim communities. Uh, let me mention uh, a real, uh, <laughs> very evident case. Uh, the story of uh, Milan's Islamic Cultural Institute. The Islamic Cultural Institute in the early 80s it was, it, was, it was founded in 1982 by the Egyptian Al-Gamal Islamia, uh, a former garage turned into a mosque, and uh, uh, known as the Viale Yenner Mosque, and it acquired enormous importance for the global jihadist movement when the conflict broke out in Bosnia in 92. And not only was this the imam of the uh, Islamic Cultural Institute, Anwar Shaban, the commander of the Foreign Fighters Mujahideen Battalion, Milan was, became also a crucial node supplying documents, money, logistical support for volunteers seeking to reach the battlefields. And the network was also behind the first suicide bombing in a European country because in 1995, car bomb attack against the police station in Rijeka in Croatia was or organized by a Milan resident of Egyptian descent. And so on and so on. Police found uh, hundreds of false documents in that seat and in other mosques, in, in other radicalized center. Um, the, we had militants from Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, who, who came to Italy and started to congregate in the late 80s, early 90s, in, in Milan, Brescia, uh, Reggio Emilia, and, and so on. It, so, it, it is a, a, very, a very worrisome uh, uh, situation in the picture um, among, among our Muslim uh, communities. And how, how to react to, to, to all of this? For, of course, it is a question not only of prevention, but trying to find a ways of integration towards communities which are very difficult to, to integrate. Because uh, in certain areas, in certain cities, uh, in, especially in northern Italy, the percentage of Salafists is around one third of, of, the, of the Muslim uh, who go to mosque and observe. It's a very high percentage and, and it's developing very fast. They are very efficient in spreading the Wahhabism, the big financial support. They get the money uh, they need when they want to open a new mosque and it happens almost every week in, uh, in, in, very part, in, in different parts of the country. And, uh, and, and that is something that uh, it's very difficult also conceptually to, uh, uh, to, uh, to develop a strategy on, on how to integrate the Salafist. How, does, uh, uh, how can we integrate the Salafist? They want to integrate us. It's, it's, it's the other way around. It's a, it's a sort of an ivory tower uh, which is there, fixed in uh, close to Piazzale Loreto. You have those groups, you see them physically. 
they, they don't even look at you. And th there is no way that you, you can say, hey, ciao, come stai? No, no. That, that is a, is a total uh, wall in their, in their mentality, in their preparation. So it is an extremely challenging situation. If you continue to spread to our public and to tell, yes, no, there is no, uh, still is not proven, we don't know whether these people are at the end, and we will never try it, this, this is really the wrong way of engaging in an enormous challenge that, that we have to face. Uh, I, I don't want to, to get into the uh, legislative proposal that they, they have been tabled, as I mentioned before, uh, but for sure we have different level. There is a complete um, a, a, a system of, of inf informative, a, a complex informative system uh, has to be created, national level and the European level. We have heard uh, the coordinator, anti-terrorist coordinator this morning saying that there is a huge work to do, a huge, but, but I had the impression that uh, he was uh, more optimistic about the work that he has in front of him than the, about the work that he has passed his, his shoulder, unfortunately, for the problems that we have of rivalries and uh, misunderstanding, perhaps, among uh, the, 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 different the, the different member states. But, uh, well, uh, that is uh, what, what I wanted to, to contribute. The, there are possible uh, policies and strategies in, in the prisons. One of the, uh, the, the big, we were reading on, uh, on the French uh, uh, newspaper over the last few days, uh, now uh, they are revisiting uh, again uh, the idea of putting together all the jihadists uh, in, uh, in, selected, in, in certain parts of the prison because they have, uh, this is a strategy they adopted a couple of years ago and they uh, realized that it works exactly the other way around. So uh, uh, we, we have to separate them instead of putting, just to mention an example. Uh, but there are also huge investment to make in, in education, uh, to make in, in, in cultural development, and, and the basic uh, message that I think it should be, should be sent uh, also to our public, but especially to our politicians, we have not to give up our basic values when we try to, to, to start a dialogue uh, with our Muslim communities. They have to identify exactly uh, what are the constitutional principles? Uh, a few days ago, an imam was sent back to Morocco because after having been resident in Italy for 10 years, he wanted to get the Italian citizenship. And he publicly refused, also as a matter of propaganda uh, within his community, he publicly refused to take an oath on the Italian Constitution because he was saying there is an article in the Italian Constitution which establishes for the full parity between men and women. This is not in, in, my, in, in my faith, and I cannot, I cannot take an oath on, on this basis. So uh, it, uh, we, we have to, uh, to be together in, uh, in making uh, a, a being firm in implementing our laws. Thank you. Thank you. I know Yassine is, is burning to, uh, to, to weigh in on this, lots of interesting issues. But I, th I think this is a good time to, uh, to, to open this up. And uh, uh, when we do, just please just very briefly introduce yourself and try to put a question mark at the end of the sentence rather than uh, de delivering uh, a speech. So I saw a lady in the front here, and then I'll, I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll get, I'll get to you as well. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm Aaron Stern from Middle East Forum. Yassine, could you speak to the concept of Arab nationalism in Egypt as well? Yeah, yeah. Which was, um, I was during the Egyptian protests when the women were out. Um, that, that's one. Uh, from a social policy perspective, how much is the, the first generation willing to jump in? Immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Should we start start with that? Sure. Yes, yeah. <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a bit of an awkward term. Um, the first time I, I came across was after it occurred uh, in the course of the Egyptian Revolution. Um, what's meant by it, what it describes, is a situation in which uh, a large number of men encircle a woman or several women 
and molest them sexually um, with the idea of putting them under pressure and making them leave, making them go away. This is how it was employed in the course of the Egyptian revolution close to Tahrir Square in the middle of Cairo. And the perpetrators of the first time that you know this became an issue in the context of the revolution, the perpetrators were what they called Baltajis in, in Egypt. They were supporters of the Mubarak regime. This happened before he fell. Um, and, and it was basically a physical, violent tactic to um, scare demonstrators, in that case, the female demonstrators. Um, they are precursors of the phenomenon, um, but the term taharrush, because you asked for it, the term taharrush, I came across it in that context, and it was used by NGOs mainly, pro-women NGOs, um, who tried to describe it. Um, so when this happened in Cologne, the German federal police did some research, and they re-imported or imported the term, and then it made its career in Germany. I'm not really sure whether it's absolutely appropriate to use it in that in that context. I, I it speaks to the misogyny in, that's evident in Yeah, I mean, there is evident misogyny in, in many Muslim or Arab countries, uh, as there is in many countries all over the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's important to me in this context is that what happened in Cologne, and I have no problem calling it out for what it is. I mean, it was terrible. There were rapes happening there. It is not acceptable under no circumstances. But what's most important to me analytically in the context of what we are discussing today is that the guys who did it may come from Muslim countries, but no single part of their motivation was in any way Islamist or Muslim at all. These guys are as far away from their religion as you can be. They drink all day, they take drugs all day. It's not a Muslim thing, but it was turned into a Muslim thing by Islamophobic forces on the right in Germany. And I think we should try and keep that, keep that apart as much as we can. And I want to say two sentences, because I think we are not that far apart, really. I don't think anybody's denying that there have been jihadist structures or militant radical Muslim structures within immigrant communities for the past 30 years all across Europe. But if you ask the question differently, if you ask the question, does the influx of 1.1 or 1.2 million people from mainly Muslim countries pose a direct and immediate terrorist threat to the European Union, I think then the answer you know, may well be not, not right now. No, it's, we're not all going to die because we took a million Syrians in. There are some problematic cases among them, and we can look at them and try and deal with them. But it's not like this is a huge wave of jihadists that we are importing. I think quite the opposite is true. Most of the Syrians that I speak to in Germany, they're pretty sick of religion. They have seen what religion can do or what religious extremism can do in their country. They are happy not to be there. They're fleeing from Daesh. You know? They are very, very far away from being vulnerable to radicalization. Some of them are. I, I grant you that. I, I accept that, and I know it's true. But I don't think this is a problem that we cannot manage. Integration is a different issue than security. And I agree, integration is a big problem. But I'd like to keep them apart as much as we can. Um, Alex? Yeah. If anyone here wants to make me happy today, please differentiate between refugees and immigrants. If you can achieve that, I'm leaving here as a happy person. That's <laughs> one thing I would like to leave here. So um, we have around 4 million Muslims in Germany. It's not 100% clear because you don't have to register your religion, but that's the assumed number. 2.8, 2.9 are Turkish. And they came here because we asked them to come to help rebuild Germany, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. They all wanted to go back. Most didn't. So there was never an integration effort. They kind of established parallel societies. Many integrated. Some stay in parallel societies. They have nothing to do with Syrian refugees. They don't see them. The Turkish working immigrants see themselves not very close to Syrian war refugees. They see them rather as competition. Because a lot of the Turkish immigrants <coughs> still, after 30, 40 years, at the lower end of society, income-wise, social security in a broader context-wise. So now there are a lot of people coming, competing for um, work that, where you don't need a PhD for. And so a lot of people are sympathetic and open-minded, but they see them as potential competition. We had different refugee waves. Uh, the, the Balkan Wars, of course, um, led to a million, by the way. a million people from the Balkans mm -hmm. were more or less integrated. We had a couple, I'm not, I'm not even sure if it was 100,000, but from Lebanon, of course, a civil war in Lebanon. We have a lot of Lebanese, Christians, Christian. Shia, yeah. uh, mostly Hezbollah is very present in Germany and different forms was mentioned uh, 
at the beginning as well. So um, the, they are inter they, they help, I think, but they don't know how yet. And also the Muslims in Germany are not well organized. Only 15% are organized in uh, organization, in structures, in associations with a legal background. And many of them are very conservative or nationalistic or Islamist. So 90% uh, of Muslims in Germany have no representation. They don't think about politics a lot. They, they live their lives. So they also should organize, and we try to help them, capacity building, networking, leadership training as good as we can. But um, it is a generational effort for everyone in Germany. And only because there's a lot of Turks in Germany does not give them more responsibility, I think, uh, to deal with the Syrians. Everybody should be involved. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, my name is John Zeitband. I'm a law student at uh, Frankfurt University, Germany. And uh, I would like to ask my question to Mr. Alexander Rissman uh, in referral to what you said about uh, refugees and immigrants uh, learning German. Uh, it takes them roughly five years, but mo uh, a lot of immigrants, um, sorry, um, refugees are um, not planning on staying that long. Thank you. <laughs> sure. uh, a lot of uh, refugees are not planning on staying that long, returning um, as soon as the war ends. Um, so they're, they're probably not going to find work in Germany. Do you, what would you say should we do with them? Should we just have them live off the state? Or, um, because I can't think of any alternative of that to that. Um, I would just like, would like to hear what you think um, we could do with them. No, the, the bad news to what I said earlier, and thank you for the question, is that I don't think that the conflict is ending anytime soon. Too many external actors, too many conflicting uh, and uh, representations and proxy things going on. I don't th see the Syrian conflict coming to an end where a million or two people would go back uh, in the next five years. So this is what the refugees want, I think, but, and I, I cannot predict the future, but I don't see any indications that this uh, will happen soon. So, but we still need to, and I'm talking, I speak about this because a lot of people are not that motivated then to learn the language because they plan on going back as soon as possible. Um, and there's a lot of work that you, where you don't need to be fluent in German. People need to speak German, of course, to a degree and understand it to a degree, and they go to the courses. Also, they have to go to the language courses. Um, but it's, if we put the bar too high, I think we frustrate people. We should try to bring them in, into work and into uh, social activities as soon as possible but not only from a government to the individual refugee uh, perspective. We need to empower the, the refugee communities to, to speak for themselves and come up with ideas how to integrate as well. You know what, right now it's a one-way communication and that never, maybe in the military it works, but outside of the military that never works. But this is how it is right now. So we need the refugees and immigrants to organize themselves and talk with society and and come up with solutions they will accept and invest in. Only then they are successful. You cannot force someone to learn a language. It's never going to work. Alex, I'll just follow up on this point because I think it's very important. Assuming that we, I, I accept your analysis that the Syrian civil war, despite recent announcements of a ceasefire, is not is not going to end any time soon. And even if it does, I mean the country is devastated. I mean, it, I mean, uh, uh, large parts of Syria make Mogadishu look like uh, Shanghai, uh, you know, like like uh, Hong Kong or Manhattan. I mean, it's that bad. I mean, the country is truly, truly devastated. So let's assume that this is a little bit of a misnomer, and that we're, we're that there's a, we have a group of people here who um, this whole narrative of oh, this is this is just for two or three or four or five years. Uh, disturbs me because also we know historically that, that that it doesn't happen that way. I mean, people have children and they change and etc. Isn't that isn't that in itself sort of a, a, a barrier to successful management of this issue? Um, the issues? The maintenance of um, what is likely to be an illusion uh, of repatri uh, you know, large numbers of, of people being repatriated back to, to, to Syria or Iraq any, 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 time, any time soon. Is that, does that help or is that, does that create a, a barrier? I'm, I'm, I'm interested yeah. here. 
I'll, I'll just uh, say something very briefly. We have repatriated half of the refugees that came to Germany from the Balkans and didn't seem to have been a large problem because most people have forgotten about it. They don't even remember it. So there was a million refugees from Balkans. There are half a million went back, half a million states. So what, what's the big deal? Nobody cares. Um, the other thing with the Syrians that are in Germany right now, I think uh, Alex made one important point about the ones with children. Mm -hmm. Now think about this for a second. Put yourself in the shoes of a refugee from uh, Aleppo, let's say, and you know you need to flee because you know the houses next door have been bombed, and you have children. You don't want to die there. You want to have your family alive around you. So you have two options. You can go and try and make your way to Jordan, where you will be living in a camp, or you will be working for two dollars a day doing something that is not, you know, really very nice, or you can try and make your way to Europe where you will have a better future for your children because they will be sent to school in Germany, for example, to a good school. They will learn German very quickly. They all learn German very quickly. Uh, and once they are in school, the likelihood that you will ever go back decreases exceptionally. So I think that most Syrians with families who have children in school in Germany, they will stay. And they will be all right because their children already speak German. They are translating for their parents in, 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 in every official visit that they have to do already. It's in, uh, integration sometimes oddly works very fast with groups that you would least expect it of. They are, they're, 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 they are Turkish uh, first generation immigrants to Germany who have been here 55 years and speak no German. And there are Syrian refugees who already have found jobs and speak very good German. So I think it's very hard to, um, or it's, it's very, um, we should be very careful in trying to, to, to generalize here. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, to, to put lipstick on a pig here. Uh, I'm trying to see the chances. Uh, I think this is not the end of, of the Western world as we know it. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Quick question, then ladies, oh, ladies over there. Yeah, can you stand up? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I want uh, to ask uh, next uh, question. We are see in last uh, uh, three, uh, five years uh, that uh, to Western Europe uh, uh, come uh, very, very uh, biggest wave. Uh, of uh, immigrants uh, uh, from Africa, from the Middle East, uh, and uh, other uh, places uh, of the third uh, world. And uh, I want uh, to ask uh, a question. If uh, you uh, not see any relation, any connection between uh, this uh, immigration uh, from Africa and the Middle East uh, to Europe uh, uh, to very, very hard uh, social and uh, economic uh, situation in uh, these uh, regions, uh, in, uh, in uh, our region, in the uh, region of Africa. Uh, we have seen uh, last time uh, that uh, from uh, Libya and from Syria uh, come uh, very, very lot of uh, people uh, to Europe. Right, thank you. So the connection between uh, instability, economic problems in the wider European neighborhood, and, and future uh, waves of, uh, of immigration. Perhaps we can, uh, well, so we, whoever wants to address that issue will be able to. Uh, lady um, with the bl blue dress and the white hat, please, just introduce yourself. That's what I noticed from here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and on the floor. Okay, just one quick question, please. We heard about some of the uh, uh, influence in Italy, and we heard about the difference between refugees and, and uh, immigrants. But there's one thing that they all have in common, and that is the very strong influence of, of uh, so many NGOs that come and, and definitely um, uh, preach for, this, for the most extreme Wahhabi uh, pattern of Islam. And they're very influential. But I would, I would like to know, this is a question mark, uh, what is done? to stop all the uh, uh, Islamic cultural centers that all over Europe, not all over the world, but also Europe. Like they, um, I'm talking about organizations like uh, WAMI, and organizations like the IILO, organizations like MWL. They are a real danger, and I have no idea if, uh, if, if anything is done to stop them, because every day they get more people to come to the center, and not just, you see, not just Muslims. Right. They influence also locals. 
So I would like to know if something is done because I look, I released with them for a very long time and I don't like what I do. Yeah, so the existing infrastructure which we know exists in Europe for, for many decades in Germany, really, since the 90, since 1950s and 60s, um, and the potential of capture, right? Because there is a competition for hearts and minds and loyalties um, of and and, and the, the especially the financial uh, influx and the infrastructure coming either Muslim Brotherhood or Salafist or Wahhabi, um, and, and the competition for the hearts and minds of the of the of the immigration. Thank yeah, you. The money is a very short thing. And the money, yeah. yeah because they definitely come as much as money the rest that uh, immigrants need, refugees need all day. So, so perhaps anyone from the panel wants to address these two, these two issues. I, I, I will try to because I looked into that as well for quite a while. First of all, my impression is that the era of big Saudi investment in religious um, uh, places in Germany and Europe for that matter is over. Um, it's beyond its peak. Um, I have uh, tried to investigate this several times. I've spoken to several um, officials in the domestic intelligence agencies because I wanted to know, you know, do they really fund these things and how do they do it? They say we never find proof. We just, I mean, they're really looking at it, you know. So I know there is money going around and I know that some of these places are problematic. I'm not denying that at all. I'm just, I'm just, my, my impression is that um, it was more 10 years ago than it is now. That is the one point. I may be wrong, but this is my impression. The second impression that I want to share is that. Um, I don't like Wahhabi Islam at all, and I don't like Saudi Arabia mingling with Muslim affairs in Europe, just to ma have that made clear. But I also think there's bigger problems um, and, and more dangerous actors uh, involved uh, in Western Europe in terms of um, supporting radical places or places of radicalization, I should say, rather. Um, Pierre Fogel was mentioned uh, today by, by Alex. He um, went on a scholarship to Saudi Arabia to study in uh, Medina. And it was fully covered by the Saudi government. And so he would totally be one of the persons of concern. And he is, in a way, because he is a radical Salafi. But at the same time, because he is you know, on the payroll of the Saudis, he is against IS, or at least he's preaching against IS, because this is the Saudi line. You know? So those who are preaching IS are clearly more dangerous at the moment, anyway, than those who are speaking out against IS. But again, the problem with Salafism in all its forms is that it's causing an integration problem. By, an, it, by definition, pretty much, you cannot be a Salafi and an active member of German society. It's impossible. You can be a Salafi and not be a criminal. You can be a Salafi and not be a terrorist. You can be a Salafi and not be criminal. You can be my neighbor as a Salafi, and I would not like it, but I can't go to the police and have them take you away. Uh, if you were a kindergarten instructor, I would probably not send my children to you in your Salafi kindergarten, you see? So there's, it's, a, it's a wide spectrum. Thank you, Ambassador Terzi. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, but um, it is another, another area where it is uh, very difficult to uh, give statistics, evidences, and uh, uh, even empirical, empirical evidence. But if we, if we look at what is happening on the other side, uh, and the southern border or the Mediterranean, it is very evident that uh, the, the concern which uh, uh, is visibly increasing in Morocco and in Egypt about uh, the uh, flow of activities uh, by the Wahhabi, uh, by the uh, Gulf countries, uh, or uh, I'm, I'm not talking about government as much, but entities which are perhaps under the radar of the governments or are simply tolerated by the governments and sometimes over encouraged. Uh, take, for example, uh, what is doing the King of Morocco, what uh, he has been doing over the last couple of years. Last year, he funded a very important institution for training and teaching the imam of, uh, uh, that, 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 that are going, and, and, that they are, are, and this program is also addressed to other African countries of the neighborhood, and not only of the neighborhood. Uh, what is happening with the, uh, the uh, Al-Aram um, uh, institution with the university in, uh, in Egypt, and starting with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the impact that had worldwide uh, the speech made the uh, Egyptian president uh, to, uh, to the Al-Aram, say Al-Azhar, uh, Al-Azhar um, uh, uh, University. Uh, it is very evident that Al-Azhar, Al-Tayeb, uh, is uh, 
and making big effort and has been doing that for many years. They were doing things similar to, to the programs that we have seen in Morocco. But now this effort is accrued in financial terms and also as organizational effort, as a policy uh, vision in those two countries. Why? Because they perceive very clearly the threat of a, a infiltration of most extremism views and interpretation of Islam in their own countries, in their neighborhood, but also abroad. And they see that also in, in Europe. And it, it's not a case if government or countries like mine are starting cooperation with, this, uh, with these other uh, entities and institutions also uh, to try to come up uh, with a question of uh, educational programs uh, for, for instance, preachers, imams, and, and so on. This, if you look in that direction, is it's very clear that there is a, a general understanding that there is a, 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 a growing uh, tension uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, I, I don't want to expand uh, on uh, the situation concerning the Shia and especially Iran. The big difference uh, between uh, uh, the um, Sunni uh, uh, reality and the Shia reality is that while for the Sunni uh, these uh, uh, influences uh, of extremist interpretation of Islam are somehow hidden, are not generally admitted. For a country like Iran, this is done in the open, and they, they mobilize huge resources. Uh, in my country, for instance, there are important mosques which are directly uh, financed uh, by uh, Iranian uh, uh, governmental institutions is not uh, the ministry of, of uh, religion, but uh, the, the governmental institution for sure, and uh, and also association, big uh, think tank networks, uh, which uh, present themselves as uh, the people who like to promote peace in the Mediterranean. They even uh, they don't even talk about Iran, about Shia, and so on, but. They are moving exactly the kind of hatred propaganda against uh, Jews, against Western uh, uh, interest, and, and so on. So uh, it, 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 is, uh, it is really a dimension which is moving quite, quite fast. Thank you. Can I add one sentence? Yes, please, and then Alexander wanted to uh, weigh yes, in as I'm well. Sorry. No I'm sorry, it's just that I think we need also to bear in mind that because you mentioned governments are, you know, that we are cooperating with, um, we need to understand that uh, our German finance minister called it that we are living through a deja vu with globalization. I think that's true on many levels. Um, and things have repercussions these days. When we strike a deal with Turkey in the refugee crisis um, and Erdogan um, you know, does what he does in Turkey and suddenly there's 30,000 people in Germany demonstrating for the death penalty in Turkey, you know, we can see that there are repercussions. Mm -hmm. When we strike a deal with Egypt, a government that has, you know, done everything, everything that is possible to make a radical Islamist out of every Muslim brother that ever lived in that country, we should not be surprised if this comes back to haunt us. So we have to look at how credible are our policies, how credible are our deals that we strike with people in that region of instability, mm -hmm. and what, what are going to be the repercussions. This may be helpful for the next one or two years, but what happens in five or ten years? We are sometimes not very wise. I think, in the way that we package and parcel these deals. Yes, thank you. Following up on the not very wise, so Salafis, from my perspective, of three things, dangerous, um, youth culture, and iceberg. So dangerous, um, Yassin mentioned intelligence reports, um, the majority of those who left for Syria and Iraq were in some sort of Salafi context before. Sometimes just for weeks, sometimes just for months, but they had some sort of contact with Salafists and they said they were Salafists and therefore there is a connection between violent jihad and Salafism, obviously, right? But most seem to be young people who are tempted by what Salafism offers. A new life, simple rules, brotherhood. People are scared of you. If you were nothing before, suddenly people will go, oh my God, this guy has a beard and a funny looking dress, what is going on? You get respect, you get a perspective, you get a lot of attention. So they offer you what maybe before were other sorts of youth cultures. For some people this is attractive and they leave Salafism once they find out that the simple rules 
don't lead to what they look for. And they get married maybe and they have a girlfriend and kids. Some stay, but most leave at some point. At least that's how it looks. But it is growing. My concern is still not Salafism. Salafism is the iceberg, the top of it. Everybody sees them, everybody's concerned, they're under government surveillance, they're, there's a talk show about them every day. Most of political Islam is not visible. Mm -hmm. It's Hezbollah, it's the Brotherhood, and Hezbollah is capable, professional, strategic, everything that Salafism is not. And the Brotherhood has been here for 50, 60 years, infiltrating organization and going for the long run looking for a counter and parallel society and they have the organizations that sometimes the German government is working with and funding. So if I look in the long run, I am of course concerned about Salafism and what the Saudis have been doing it all, but from my perspective, Hezbollah and Iran and uh, the Brotherhood's ideology and infrastructure in Europe is a bigger threat. Yeah, very, very important point. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the, on the watch. I see a lot of hands going up. Let's do this. I want to take three brief questions from the hands that I've seen from the gentleman in the, in the blue shirt from you and the gentleman over there. And let, then let's see if we have time for another quick round. But let's hear uh, three quick questions and then perhaps any, anyone from the, the panel would want to address uh, different, different dimensions. Where are the guarantees for the people, for the white, traditional, Christian, European, in everything that you've said? It's going to take one person, whether they're a refugee, whether they're a migrant, whether they are someone from ISIS dressed up as, to change this dynamic that you drew even more, mm -hmm. to make the situation more difficult. I think, to some extent, what you're presenting is naive to say that it's, you know, I think it was too black and white. The other question, so I get two, three. The other question, <laughs> well, uh, media. I'm, I'm a journalist by training. We get knocked the whole time. I think you're absolutely right. Again, I think there was a naivety that you're presenting as a, as a journalist just coming from one place. There's a problem on the other side that journalists are too scared because of political correctness sometimes to call these things what they actually are. Are you working, I guess this is especially to you, Alexander, are you working with journalists Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to remind you um, that uh, I think it was Yassin who said, and this sort of struck with me, that we're essentially one large terrorist attack away from sort of panic, at least in at least in at least in at least in Germany. And that that is again, I'm not sure we're going to have time to to address this, but it raises the issue of social resilience. Or how do you prepare the population for the likely eventuality that eventually you will have a um, a major, a major incident, and, and so and so on. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is: You've all elaborated on the process of. Uh, uh, sorry, my name is Ella Braxton. I'm from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, you've all elaborated on the process of uh, radicalization in, in, in immigrant societies in Europe. Um, some of you touched on the importance of social media as a tool of, of propagating messages. Alex, uh, Alexander, you, you, you've taken it further into the find the swarms. Um, given we're seeing similar patterns uh, of radicalization through social media in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, especially the last intifada, we have a wave of 13-year-olds taking knives and going to murder Jews. Just through exposure to content, radicalizing content on social media, I would like to ask you, um, this respected panel, your opinion of the importance of radicalization within social media, digital uh, outlets of communication, uh, uh, pertaining to this particular wave of, of radicalization in Europe uh, these, uh, these days. Okay, thank you. Uh, sir? Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sabo. I am from Polish Academy of the Czech Republic in Prague. Uh, my question is related uh, to the way adopted uh, very quickly following uh, uh, events 9-11, uh, many documents, action plans, plan against 
uh, terrorism, uh, how to fight TV, and and so on. But it looked like Europe, or the European Union, was not uh, prepared. It was taken by surprise. And uh, uh, now we have this problem. I suppose we, we have to address this issue, how it happened, whether the, the solution adopted was optimal, because th this is a problem we will be facing for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. So wh why do we do this? Perhaps we'll, we'll go across the panel, starting from, from Alex and, and, and going this way. Um, and I, I fear, as, we, as we, we say, we certainly have not exhausted the subject, but perhaps the subject is beginning to exhaust us. So we'll, um, I think that we'll probably finish at the end of this. Uh, so any, any last words from the panelists would be, um, uh, would be uh, opportune uh, in this context as well, if, if you want to. Where you start, Alex? So to the journalist's question, you, you can only really inform or educate people who are interested in being informed and educated, right? So we work with people who want to get something from us mostly. Um, if that's journalists, it's journalists. But a lot of bureaucrats and policymakers are more interested in learning. And also on the refugee and immigrant side, a lot of people have a deeper demand for information and networking and all. But we're happy for every journalist who wants to you know, get a broader perspective. The online radicalization uh, thing uh, that Elad mentioned, uh, the technical capacity to take down hate speech and extremist inciting content needs to be massively increased, of course. But there are challenges that come with that. Uh, the industry always says, what is the extremist content? We have definitions, but an ISIS fighter beheading someone is extremist content. An ISIS fighter stroking a kitten, which they actually do, promoting Nutella, which they actually do. Is that extremist content or not? So we're still at the definition thing while some actors are into algorithms, coding, proactive going after it. And I think we have just started understanding how complex and immense the threat is and that we need to get much faster countering it. Yeah, please. I have just a few sentences. Uh, mm. I would like to say that uh, uh, according to our assessment, we are afraid about the future because uh, we are afraid that uh, uh, some people uh, should be much, much more aggressively radically light in the future if they will be not successful uh, in Europe, if they will be not uh, fully integrated uh, to the European society. Uh, Czech uh, uh, example is uh, not so uh, representing like uh, uh, examples from Germany or, or, or Italy, but uh, I said uh, during my speech that we have also quite a small uh, Muslim community in the Czech Republic, something about uh, two, uh, uh, something about uh, 20,000 people uh, came to the former Czechoslovakia, originally from Syria and Iraq uh, in the 70s and 80s last century. These uh, people are fully integrated in our society, and interesting is that, uh, according to information from this community, they are afraid about uh, about uh, uh, a new wave of migration from uh, from Syria uh, and uh, Iraq uh, to the Czech Republic as well because of uh, possible radicalization uh, radicalization of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you see, please. I'll take up uh, your point about na nativity. Um, while it is true that in Germany. Um, I would say culturally, a majority of most journalists would describe themselves as liberal and or left-leaning rather than right-leaning and conservative. While that is true, I assure you that one of the least problems we have is political correctness. Um, pretty much any newspaper has written pretty much everything, breaking most rules of political correctness at one point in time relating to the refugee influx and to the migration um, influx that we've seen last year. Um, in my paper, we have had both. We've had it both ways. We had, have had very naive, very dreamy, very everything is going to be great articles. And the next week, we have people thrashing the government politics, saying the government was naive and you know what we are doing is suicidal. We have had everything and the opposite. And I think this is true for most papers in Germany. As far as I'm concerned myself, I will admit openly that I think that most of what the government did last year, uh, I don't have a huge problem with it. But still, I wrote the first article in Germany about um, uh, Islamist um, refugees from Syria and Iraq, bullying Christian refugees from those countries within government-paid German 
asylum seekers' housing uh, establishments because it just pissed me off. I didn't like it. I'm a journalist. I have to look where things happen. I can't choose what I think is happening. It's happening, and I report on it or I don't. And I choose not to be politically correct. I do what I think is important. Um, so, so it, but I, I, and I'm not going to say anything about the other two points because I think this is really important. Nonetheless, all across Europe, and I'm sure that's the case in the US as well, I don't know about Israel, um, the press and the media in general have lost a lot of trust. People have stopped trusting um, newspaper journalists, for example, um, uh, in the way that they used to. And I find this very, very concerning. I understand sometimes why people get angry. But they, they, they go to a kiosk, there are 10 newspapers and everything. Every newspaper seems to be writing the same op-ed every day. You know, um, I understand why that can be frustrating. Um, but to assume that because that is so, we are all paid by the CIA, the government, Putin, or I don't know who, is, you know, that's just, I'm sorry, I mean, professionally, that's an insult, you know. I mean, people don't understand how we work and how we operate, and maybe we should be much better at explaining how we operate and how we work and, and how you come to the conclusions that we come to. But I, 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 I see this as a big problem because democracy relies on an informed public. And the public is never being informed by the government. It's being informed through media. And if that link is broken, and I see this link in danger at the moment, this is very, very, very dangerous. It is good that the uh, uh, government, uh, the media, uh, are not directly connected. Yes. It is a, a, a partial truth, the fact that the media are not directly connected to government, because uh, it depends on the kind of, uh, we have to check the statistics in uh, Freedom House and so on, and we know that even in some European countries, <laughs> there is a <laughs> large influence uh, by, by, by the government on the, on the media on system. The so whatever, whatever they say on the industry, on the owners, uh, and, uh, and the connection are extremely close. So if the government takes a policy of communication on a certain, on a delicate subject like this, the, most of the media, uh, at least in my country, for instance, 80 percent of the media are not going to confront the government on a, on a migration, on general migration political correctness. Uh, so th 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 that is a personal experience. Just two, two very quick uh, points. Uh, yesterday uh, we listened to uh, a, uh, a keynote speech by uh, the Kenyan uh, uh, counterterrorism coordinator, where uh, Kenya is a frontline country, not uh, a field of fight perhaps, but surely a frontline country. He, uh, I, I was interested by um, his um, view that uh, in his can also in his country uh, in, in, there is, um, uh, uh, is needed uh, the truth about uh, the origin of jihadism. It is not as much a, a socio-economic factor. Uh, it can be, of course. Uh, it, it, can, the, the, it has an influence. It has an impact. The economy, the marginalization, uh, the disenfranchisement of communities. But uh, it's not the determinant uh, uh, factor in uh, um, moving people towards uh, jihad. Uh, the, the, uh, he emphasizes very much the importance of education in the system. And, and, and I think it is remarkable that we have uh, this message from a country uh, like Kenya, uh, because it matches exactly with some conviction that we have, but, but it's very important that also in key, among uh, key African players, there is this conviction that jihadism has to be confronted on basic values and uh, and uh, an individual um, uh, approach uh, in, in education and information and personalities. The second point I wanted to make is that uh, uh, in, in this panel discussion, we didn't have time to develop uh, consideration about uh, the uh, polit uh, foreign policy dimension of radicalization and uh, jihadism. And that comes exactly to the relationship between the European Union, the United States, our individual uh, nations, uh, with the key <laughs> uh, influencer and enablers of uh, jihadism. And again, Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, and uh, Pakistan, uh, and, and some others. And a general conclusion, I, be I believe it should be that our countries have to speak much more clearly and to tell the truth about radical Islam and the, and, and the kind of relationship 
we want to develop with those governments and how important is a cooperative approach, a true cooperative approach by them in uh, uh, fighting together with us uh, against radicalization and jihadism. But in order to do so, we have to have a clear agenda in the foreign security policy. Uh, we cannot ignore that Wahhabism and uh, all the movement of madrasas around the world of uh, uh, Salafist cultural center are also in reaction to a, uh, a agenda of domination, I would say, that Iran has been spreading over the last 30, 40 years, uh, surely after the Islamic Resolution, in a revolution in, in its neighborhood. And therefore, uh, it is, there is a necessity that the Western countries uh, be more forthcoming in understanding the security uh, concern of countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, and the Gulf countries. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. I mean, clearly the, the iceberg metaphor here is, uh, is apt, and we've just uh, began to scratch the surface. Let's hope we're not, we don't repeat the Titanic story and uh, sink ourselves. Before we, we leave, I want uh, to please uh, join me in thanking, first of all, Manuela uh, Kulka and Ofik Sudri for putting this together organizationally. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, and of course, uh, our wonderful panelists. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much.